Yes, I want to call this uh, regular meeting of Village Council to order uh, the January 26, 2019 meeting. And uh, Judy, if you could please call the roll. Yes, Hush. I'm here. McQueen. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Sanford. Here. Also present Village Manager Patty Bates. Here. Here. Okay. okay. Um, so next I will entertain a motion to go into executive session. Um, Uh, and then do we want to read the... You do need to do that. Yes. <laughs> Would um, anyone like me to read the uh, illustrated guide on how to bridge your phone? Uh, yes, uh, we'll, so we'll get to that in announcement. So, uh, yeah, so I, I will complete the sentence. Um, yeah. I'll entertain a motion to go into executive yeah. session for discussion of the discipline of a public employee and potential sale of real estate. Are we going now? Yeah. We're moving. I move, and I second. Okay. Um, okay, Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yeah. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Sanford. Yes. Okay. I don't know, just remember to come out. session we've got a couple swearing-ins to do and then we'll uh, run right through the agenda so uh, it looks like I've at least got a couple arts and culture folks so uh, Aaron and Cheryl I'm gonna come down and uh, all right um, I think we usually have you guys over here so we can get you on camera um, make sure it's your good side both sides are my good side. Of course they are. Okay, so um, welcome, and uh, please repeat after me and uh, raise your right hand if you like. I solemnly affirm. I solemnly affirm. I always just choose. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And of the state of Ohio. And of the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the charter and the ordinances. Observe the provisions of the charter and the ordinances. Of the village of Yellow Springs. Of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. And it will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. And you can say it. Arts, Arts and Culture, Culture Commission. Oh, we got Dino and AJ. Oh, look at this. All right. So, Saul and Henry, why don't you guys come up next? All right. Grab one of these sheets if you like. And uh, oh, by the third time, everybody will have it. All right. All right. So, and uh, we're going to add the thing you wanted to add, too. Um, all right. So, I solemnly affirm. I solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And of the state of Ohio. And of the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the Charter and the ordinances. Observe the provisions of the Charter and the ordinances. Of the village of Yellow Springs. Of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. And 
we will gratefully discharge the duties of the Office of the Economic Sustainability Commission. All right. So all thank you. And thank you. All right. I solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution and will obey the laws of the United States. I will obey the laws of the United States and of the state of Ohio. And of the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the Charter and the ordinances. Observe the provisions of the Charter and the ordinances. Of the village of Yellow Springs. Of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. Commission. Okay, so welcome again everyone. Uh, I am going to uh, put the sign up sheet for anyone that wants to speak back at the end of the table for anyone that would like to sign up. Uh, but we will also take uh, people that are not on the uh, list as well. Uh, we could pass it around. That's a great idea. Um, so, uh, we next have announcements. Uh, any announcements from uh, council members? Okay, Patty? I would like to wish a happy upcoming birthday to both council persons, uh, McQueen and Housh. All right, thank you, Patty. All right, got a couple of Aquarians here. Um, I have three things I want to announce. First of all, I want to thank everyone who was involved in uh, the celebrations yesterday for uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, once again, it was a great celebration, quite cold, uh, but I appreciate everybody that was involved and uh, very important uh, uh, signature event in our village. Um, second thing is I would like to thank uh, the hard work that our village team has been doing around uh, the snow events and other issues that we've had. I noticed that uh, our electric goes on a lot quicker than DPNLs in a lot of areas, so I appreciate their uh, immediate response on that. I also know our dispatchers have been working really hard, and uh, just in general, uh, this is the time of the year where people work long hours. And last thing I wanted to mention, uh, which is something you read about in the paper, this Saturday, the Yellow Springs schools are having their first uh, speech and debate tournament. And I just wanted to mention that all residents are welcome to see what's happening, uh, come and observe. Uh, we can always use an extra judge or two if you uh, think that debate or speech is uh, something you'd like to get into. But we'll be at both the Mills Lawn and the Middle School <coughs> High School Saturday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and there'll be an awards and ceremony at the end of that. So I know the kids would, uh, would love the support. So with that, uh, we will now talk about... I, I actually have two quick announcements. Yes, oh, go ahead. Um, one is, I got an email from Cat Walter. The Repair Cafe is Saturday, February 2nd from 1 to 4. They will mm -hmm. fix just about anything except a cell phone. Uh, and the other is that lights, walking lights and bike lights are in the, <clears throat> the shopping bag out on the um, table out there if you want to grab one on your way out. Great. Thank you, Judy. What's the time again? 1 to 4 mm -hmm. on February 2nd. And where? Oh, at... Antioch in the um, sculpture annex, <clears throat> right, Carlos? In the sculpture sculpture yeah. annex, the yeah. repair cafe. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So next we have our consent agenda, and uh, we have minutes uh, from our December seventeenth regular meeting, our December nineteenth uh, mini retreat, and our or no, that was. Yeah, that was our mini retreat. Mm -hmm. And our January 7th regular meeting. So I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I move that we approve the minutes. I second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed, same sign. Okay. Uh, review of the agenda. Anything that we need to add, change? There are two letters, the one from Connor 
yes. and the one from the Environmental Commission that need a little council time. Should we put them on to uh, new business? Sure. Um, and I guess the other thing is in Rachel's report, she um, made some recommendations about updating the Finance Committee uh, investment policy. Uh, do we want to talk about that briefly? In new business? I think doesn't it depend on what time it is? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, fair enough. So let's say it's a possibility. Okay. Um, so let's move into uh, petitions and communications. Marianne. There were 22 letters from community members uh, in support of uh, Officer Meister. And most of those, I think, were started off as email. They weren't in our packet, but they'll, we got them at the table. They'll be in our packet uh, next meeting. Uh, and there was a letter from Emily Seibel with some answers regarding questions to the senior housing PUD. There was a letter objecting to the senior housing PUD by Steve Kahn. The senior housing working group uh, wrote a thank you. To council. Connor Stratton uh, wrote a letter about Springfest with a request and regarding that that we'll talk about. Uh, Taki Manalakos uh, wrote a letter asking for support for the uh, right state faculty strike. And I'm not, has it happened or potential? It's going on, it's it's going on right now. Okay. Um, and the Environmental Commission has a letter draft letter to the editor regarding Brene for council approval. Okay. Thanks, Marianne. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a few pieces of legislation, and then we'll move into citizen concerns. So, uh, Judy, if you could read uh, Ordinance 2019-02 by title only. All right. This is amending the official zoning map of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, for the property located between East Marshall Street and East Herman Street, identified by the following Green County Parcel ID numbers, and I will uh, skip those, but you can read them at your leisure, on 1.853 acres from RB Moderate Density Residential District to PUD Planned Unit Development. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. A second. All right. Um, so this is the second reading uh, related to the PUD for the uh, affordable senior housing project, uh, which uh, went through planning commission, mm -hmm. went through a lengthy discussion, and we're now at our um, last vote on this PUD. Um, Patty, is anyone going to speak to this? Or? Um, I can, if you'd like. It's uh, this is just a the final step in um, the process that. Uh, is required to rezone it to PUD. If council passes this today, uh, 30 days from today, it will become effective. Um, this rezoning and a companion letter um, are necessary for Home Inc. to be able to apply for the grant um, for the senior housing. Okay. Um, so I'm going to open the hearing since this is the second reading, and do we have any uh, citizen comments on this? Okay. And uh, yeah, just make sure to say your name. Evening. I'm Hans Jacobson. I have a uh, place that's within the contiguous block of the property. So I got a letter inviting me here to the final reading. I understand uh, we need housing. <clears throat> Growing up here, my parents had a place outside of the village because it was too expensive. So I understand that we certainly have a need. It appears that this project has significant council backing. What concerns me is that the zoning is seen as a barrier to overcome rather than the protection of the uh, citizens within that neighborhood. I challenge you to do better. I think you should represent the taxpaying homeowners of this neighborhood. Zoning's there as a protection. This building is inconsistent with the neighborhood. It has, what, less than half the land that it really requires. You're going into it having to ask the neighbors for use of their property. It has four stories. 
Nothing in that neighborhood has more than two stories, including the new fire department. Since Wright State University tore down the old single-story building, the neighborhood has started to change, and it's evolving on its own. There have been five new single-family houses that have been built within that neighborhood. That's pretty significant for a small neighborhood like that without contiguous open area that they use. Five single family homes. Also remember again that your own planning commission did not approve this. Remember the Bowen study. He spent $25,000 or almost that amount for the Bowen study. The significant statement on the uh, Bowen study was that the largest share of respondents indicated that there was a high demand for single family homes. You have an opportunity for 18 homes, I think it is, within that area, if you're to use it as such. Will this open up new houses? There haven't been any studies showing that. You know, is it going to change the, the supply curve? We really don't know. We do need <coughs> housing, but not a monolithic senior warehouse the size is being driven by the funding source, not by our needs. I think it's a mistake to disregard the planning commission, the neighborhood trend that we're seeing, and the Bowen study. I don't think we should build it just because you can. I think we should build what we need. Yellow Springs deserves better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Warren, did you want to say something? Did I see your hand up? Yep. And then, oh, we do we have, if we have that you. list, are we going to have applause? Is that a thing? Or? Uh, I hope not. So, yeah. Obviously, a lot of people are going to be speaking tonight. So, if we can avoid applause, that would be uh, helpful. Warren. I would like applause, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is Warren Miller. I'm confused about the concept of due diligence with regards to this four-story, 54-unit, low-income senior apartment building. The Yellow Springs Council has pushed this process through in order to help Comey, in my opinion, to meet its February 21st, 2019 grant deadlines. And in doing so, in my opinion also, has disregarded the completion of its responsibility to due diligence. The Yellow Springs Council has voted to not accept the due diligence of the Planning Commission, and I think that's major. The impact of this project, if indeed funded, on the, Yellow Springs, Yellow, on, on the village of Yellow Springs has not been studied to the same degree, uh, or over degree, that we oftentimes um, make with many other projects that we consider. One example of that would be the water treatment plant, for instance. Countless unanswered questions regarding qualifications and policies have not been answered, perhaps up until the last minute. Building, the building is the size of a behemoth uh, uh, in, in scale. It's out of place in terms of uh, with the neighborhood. It's the only four-story building in a neighborhood of relatively small homes. There's a confusing economic information, and there are many people who still, of course, do not understand whether they would, will or will not be able to qualify for this uh, housing. Traffic, stormwater, and impact studies have been minimal, if at all or have been put on the back burner. Size is being driven by the funding source, not by the needs of the community. And it's been pushed along, or the needs have been dismissed if it further complicates meeting the funding deadline. We should not have a conversation that says, well, will this interfere with the funding deadline or not in terms of our process of doing due diligence. Changing the zoning laws to benefit Homey's development, I think, is of concern. This has happened in the last several years. If a development 
project cannot stand on its own merits without one, two, or three council members campaigning it through the planning commission and or council, then perhaps there's truly something wrong with this project. The build it and we will figure it out later style that this village has been married to in the past and the recent years is costing this village a lot in terms of finances and in terms of whether this becomes and stays a place that people want to stay at. And that's three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lauren. I, I would like to say something. The reason why I find clapping offensive is because everyone should have a chance to say something if they want. And some people are going to stand up and maybe not everyone agrees with them. And they should still have a chance to feel okay about speaking. So clapping is a way to diminish people's different voices. And I really would appreciate it if there's no clapping and if you feel like you want to acknowledge if you go like this or something. Well, we have the green cards, so. Well, it's, it's the um, same thing. Okay. Uh, so uh, any other comments, Judith, about homing? Yeah, I just, I, I wasn't planning to speak to this, but I just want to say there is a huge amount of support, as you know. I'm sorry, your name? Judith Hamplink, sorry. Uh, those uh, there's a huge amount of support for this project, as you know. You have been hearing from the elders in this community about the need for affordable senior housing for how many five generations have been hearing about this. And so uh, I, I really am excited that this is happening. I think that homing is <coughs> more than due diligence. The PUD process is for anybody who wants to use it. They have used it, they've used it well, just as the hotel used, uh, you know, used the PUD process, did they not? Um, so there's, you know, a lot of folks have used the PUD process. It's an excellent process. In terms of our zoning, yeah, I think we do need to look at our zoning because if we keep looking the way we've been looking at Yellow Springs, we're never going to uh, address our affordability crisis. And so, we need to look at it. There's a lot of new writing about zoning codes and how great the kind of restrictions basically uh, causes problems around affordability. You know, it basically we will become a very white, a very middle class, and there will not be room for people who live and who work here to even be able to live here. So I just I want to say I just speak for those who are really support this project. Thank you, Thank you Judith. Uh, Chair. I am a low-income senior person, and I don't even know that if I'm going to have enough money to qualify to live there. But God bless Home Inc. for trying. And the reason that they don't answer everybody's questions is that they don't have all the answers yet. They're just trying to patch enough together to help people such as me. All my people that I know that are my support system live here. And if I don't have enough money to live here, my very elderly years are going to be pretty grim. Thank you. Okay, thanks Sharon Muller. Uh, any other questions or comments from villagers? Okay, uh, yes, Chris? Okay, yeah, hi, Christine Roberts. Like Judith, I wasn't planning to speak to this issue, but from an environmentalist point of view, it is a better way to build. You know, you get more, you get more for less. It's, it's a better, it's a better use of resources. And I'm sorry for the neighborhood. I am very sorry for the neighborhood, but uh, it is environmental. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, so, any comments from council members? Marianne. Yeah, um, I've been seeing this through for a couple decades, actually. Um, and in terms of the Bowen housing uh, needs assessment, the, the main types of housing that that assessment listed were affordable senior housing, rental housing, moderate income home ownership. Th those were the primary needs experienced in this village. This project, which is really like the third iteration of a senior housing type of project, has not been funded yet. This is, it's not like we're going to have a 
shovel in the ground this spring. Hopefully, maybe in a couple years we will. But clearly, there's a need. And I think, as Brian once said, um, it, you know, if we continually go for the ideal that meets 100 percent of the people's uh, wishes, what we get is what we have, nothing. So this is a good project. The teams with St. Mary Development Corp, which is one of the best nonprofit senior housing development organizations in the state and probably in the country. And this project would be managed by one of the best management corporations in the country, a religious based organization, we, we cannot do better than this, truly. We cannot do better than this. Okay. Any other comments? Kevin? No. I'm sorry. Not for me. Okay. Um, uh, I will just... Brian, you have hands going up in there. And be before we close, I have comments, too. Okay. Uh, all right. Hans, just again, briefly, yes, please. Jacobson. Um, Tell me, uh, once again, it's wonderful at uh, representing Homey. I appreciate that. Uh, tell me about the study. Where did it suggest that this type of housing go? Okay. Um, it seemed to me that it suggested that it should go into Glass Farm. Was there a reason why that No, didn't? that was not a suggestion. No. Yeah, I think but, if you look at it. Well. I'm not going to start. Okay. Argue. Well, I think we have a okay. difference of opinion. Thank you. Uh, Lisa? Yeah. Um, I've reviewed all the materials all along regarding this zoning consideration. And additionally, I've attended all the planning meetings in person due to the critical importance of this topic. And I also want to point out that I live just around the corner, actually, next door to Lauren and Hans. So, you know, I also have, in addition to my council, position, I also have a, a personal reflection. And as some of you know, I've expressed some real concern about scale and more specifically the size of the building on the lot. And, and at points along the way was uh, pretty convinced that I would have a no vote on this. But I really worked to keep my mind open and to take in all of the facts. And my concern had nothing to do with the aesthetic or the cuteness or a small town vibe or whether a building of this size was too urban. My concern is one that I'm very concerned about as a council member and one that we must address as we move forward with this. Um, I think the senior apartments are much needed and my concern has always been about the sufficiency of the infrastructure and the cost to the village going forward. And I've been convinced, working with Johnny Burns, that the infrastructure work that needs to be done, that may need to be done as part of this project, is infrastructure work that we need to do no matter what. And I, I realize that this may, we may need to reevaluate the timing of certain projects and that that may be a reallocation. And as you know, the reason we have a 2019 deficit budget is because we're undertaking capital projects that have been too long delayed. So if, in fact, this project, this potential project, puts a fire under your village to take care of much needed infrastructure, then that's a good thing, whether or not this project happens or not. I also want to point out that I've done a lot of due diligence about St. Mary's Development Corporation. And I, they're, you're reputable, free with Marianne, that for any project that we would undertake in the village, we couldn't have a better partner. Um, so I'm confident that we can coordinate this project if it goes forward. But I really want to appreciate everybody who's spoken up and the citizens because it's not an easy decision. I've struggled with it a lot, and I remain in support of the project. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and I will just wrap up briefly by saying uh, it's, it's very hard to see all the work and discussion that's gone into something like this by just coming to one meeting. Um, a lot of really important issues have been raised, but I can definitely attest to due diligence being done. Uh, keep in mind that Planning Commission, which on some things that they did not approve, voted 2-2, two -two, um, has a very different role than Village Council. All right, Planning Commission must look at the code and say yay or nay. 
but there is a PUD, a plan unit development uh, aspect of uh, our zoning that allows us to make uh, special cases or to uh, recognize special cases. And if you look at the record, you will see that we looked at a lot of different issues and ultimately decided that affordable senior housing, which is what ultimately the Bowen study told us we need beyond other kinds of housing, was critical. Lots of questions were answered. I agree that there's more information to get out there, and I think that Homemake is doing their due diligence in that regard. Um, but I do want to emphasize that it was not an easy decision to make, um, but it was an important one for this village, and I do appreciate the challenges that were brought forward that helped us to modify uh, and put conditions on the project to make it the best that we can for the village. So with that, um, I think we need to take a vote. And Judy, if you could call the roll, please. Yes, Krieger. Yes. Sanford. Recused. I'm sorry. My bad. Should have gone. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're now going to move into uh, Ordinance 2019-03, which uh, is a new ordinance. Uh, Judy, I guess we can do that by title only and then just explain it. Yeah. Sure. This is repealing Section 290.01 of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 290.01, Court Night. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. Um, who is uh, talking about this, Judy? Okay. Yeah, so this is a, just a housekeeping matter, really. Um, court night has been held on Mondays, a court afternoon has been held on Mondays at 4 o'clock, as, as long as I've been here, so more than nine years. Um, and it states in our codified ordinances that it should be held on Tuesday evenings. So this is really just bringing it in line with reality and holding that spot moving forward. Okay. Um, any Questions or comments? Uh, questions or comments from citizens? Uh, okay, this is a first reading, um, so we don't need to take a vote. Uh, I don't think it looks like anything very controversial, and we certainly want to be in line with our ordinances. But this will come back at our second meeting where we will uh, have a public hearing and open a vote in case anyone's concerned about that. Um, okay, so now let's look at. Uh, Resolution 2019-05, um, and Judy, I guess let's read that in full. Okay. Without okay. the names. Okay. Okay. So this is appointing a community advisory committee to assist in selection of a new village manager. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs has initiated a national search to hire a village manager. Oh, sorry, we really, yes. That's, that actually is accurate. <laughs> Whereas the village of Yellow Springs charter requires that all executive and legislative power of the village shall be vested in the council. Whereas council has determined to appoint a committee, the committee, the community advisory committee, pursuant to the village of Yellow Springs Charter Section 17, Section and Eric, Part 8, to assist council in determining the desired qualifications and character for an ideal candidate for village manager. And whereas the purpose of the creation and appointment of the community advisory committee is intended to further the village's goal of an open government and participation by citizens, and whereas the community advisory committee is intended to act in an advisory role to council as council goes through the selection process to appoint a village manager, and whereas the community advisory committee is a municipal body and therefore subject to the notice requirements set forth in ordinance 2009-20, and whereas among the expected roles the Community Advisory Committee may provide to Council are review resumes of potential candidates selected by Council's Selection Subcommittee, participate in interviews of Village Manager candidates as selected by Council's Selection Subcommittee, and work in conjunction with Council to organize a public forum in which Village citizens can meet with finalists for the Village Manager position. Whereas the following citizens shall be appointed to the Community Advisory Committee, and we will provide that list at a later point. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that Section 1. Village Council hereby appoints the above-named residents to be members of the Community Advisory Committee. Section 2, in adopting this resolution, Council retains all its powers granted under the Charter. Section 3, the Community Advisory Committee shall be disbanded upon the appointment of the new Village Manager. Section 4, the Community Advisory Committee is a municipal body as divine, defined by Ordinance 2009-20 and subject to notice requirements and open meetings laws. Section 5, this resolution shall become effective upon its adoption. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about this one briefly. So 
Uh, hopefully everyone knows by now that um, Patty is going to be retiring in July. And so we have a uh, um, notice out for the village manager. Five years ago, we went through a very extensive process. And part of that process was maximizing the amount of citizen engagement. And the citizen committee is a big part of doing that, um, not only to help us with narrowing down the pool, but also to think about um, when we do bring the finalists to the village and making sure that uh, they meet everybody possible. Um, I do want to emphasize that while we have a citizen advisory committee to focus and provide capacity on this, um, we also, uh, every citizen can participate throughout the process. And if you look at what we did last time, which we'll be duplicating again, um, we want to make sure that when we have uh, various finalists coming to town, that people know that that's an open meeting, they can make comments and, and give us feedback. So uh, this group has sort of agreed to help us with logistics specifically. Um, I guess the other piece of this is uh, we still have uh, a few people that uh, are gonna be late joiners. So I'm not sure what the best way to proceed is. I mean, do we pass the resolution and then update the names later or? Um, I think so, because then the resolution, I mean, as soon as we've got that final list, the resolution, then I'll, I'll post it. It becomes public record. I don't, I mean, there's nothing preventing you from adding someone to the list, but I do feel like you need to pass it before your next meeting because you're going to, you need to get that committee moving. Okay, great. Um, and right now, we're looking at about uh, 15 people that have stepped up, um, and uh, it's a very diverse group. Um, so uh, any questions or comments from council? Okay. So uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We have one more piece of legislation, and uh, Judy, let's go ahead and do resolution 2019-06 uh, in full. All right, this is authorizing application to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Clean Ohio Trails Fund for the Yellow Springs Clifton Connector. Whereas the state of Ohio, through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, ODNR, administers financial assistance for public recreation purposes through the Clean Ohio Trails Fund, COTF. And whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs considers bicycle, pedestrian, and other forms of active transportation to be of the utmost importance to the community in providing the region with recreation and transportation opportunities, as well as supporting economic and community development, healthy lifestyles, and environmental sustainability. And whereas a partnership has been formed among the Village of Yellow Springs, the Village of Clifton, and Miami Township for the purpose of completing a safe and viable multi-use connector trail between Yellow Springs and Clifton and passing through Miami Township, suitable for pedestrians and bicyclists of all ages and abilities, as well as for individuals using mobility devices. And whereas the village, villages of Yellow Springs and Clifton and Miami Township desire financial assistance under the Clean Ohio Trails Fund program, now therefore be it resolved that Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, Section 1 hereby supports the combined efforts of our neighboring municipality and township and other stakeholders in creating this tangible connection of our communities. Section 2 does agree to obligate the funds required to satisfactorily complete the proposed project and become eligible for reimbursement under the terms and conditions of the COTF program. Section 3, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to execute and file an application with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources COTF program and to provide all information and documentation required to become eligible for possible funding assistance. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. I'll give a little background on this. Uh, I think by now everyone's probably heard that uh, for over 40 years, a uh, trail between Yellow Springs to get you out to John Bryan State Park and Clifton Gorge has been discussed. Um, I know that, uh, you know, Al Demon, who I'm sorry just passed, uh, was a big advocate of this trail. Uh, Dave Case left in his property uh, an easement to allow for a trail. And finally, everything's lined up. Um, and uh, about a year ago, uh, the villages of Yellow Springs and Clifton and Miami Township passed supporting resolutions for this project. There's been a lot of discussions with ODOT, Department of Transportation, ODNR, Department of Natural Resources, um, Tecumseh Land Trust, a variety of stakeholders, landowners, 
and it looks like uh, something may finally happen. Um, so this resolution is a requirement to apply for the Clean Ohio uh, Trails Fund, um, which could give us up to half a million dollars to support that project. Uh, one of the things I want to be clear is that when we say obligate funds, it means that if we get that grant, then we would be following the obligation to spend that grant, all right? This does not mean that we are um, taking uh, taxpayer dollars uh, uh, from the Village of Yellow Springs or any of the other municipalities to pay for this project. So I want to be clear that uh, this is uh, contingent on us getting the grant. And if we didn't get the grant, we wouldn't obligate the funds. Um, so uh, any questions or comments about that? Thanks. Yeah. Because I knew that would have been the question I would have asked okay. if, uh, if uh, hmm. I hadn't known about it. Um, okay, questions or comments from citizens? All right. Uh, if not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so we are now uh, at the part in the agenda, which I think most of you are here for, citizen concerns. Uh, so remember that uh, what we are listening to are comments that are not about items that are on the agenda. Um, and so I have a list of several people that have asked to speak, which I'm going to begin with. And um, then we will... Uh, take any other comments and, and uh, can I, if I can just mention yeah. inexplicably the timer is not beeping as it should so you will hear me sort of a little bit loudly say that's your three minutes because we don't have a beep so okay and since we do have a lot of folks that want to speak uh, I want to try to keep us to the uh, the, the three minutes uh, or if you can make your statement in a more concise um, manner that's great as well so actually, uh, Henry Myers, I have you on the list first. Hi, uh, I'm Henry Myers. Um, assuming what I am saying is, is legal and the state of Ohio uh, agrees with it and act that kind of um, we Having police officers live in the village is obviously a big thing. I would like to see us uh, uh, put our money in our pocket to support that. Um, maybe a, a thing would be a, a levy that we would pass to, to see if the village uh, people supported it. That would be specifically to give loans to officers who wanted to buy a house in the village. Um, this, I used loans in quote because, you know, maybe it would be something where they, they get a uh, 20, 30, $40,000 loan um, that they would, uh, when they sold the house, they'd end up paying back the same percentage that they, um, with respect to the safe, to the cost of the house. So for example, if, if someone bought a, a uh, $200,000 house and got a $20,000 loan, uh, if they sold the house for $300,000, 10%, would come out to, they'd uh, give the village 30,000. Um, so it would be uh, that type of a thing that, um, you know, might, might open up to more offices being in the village. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Henry. Um, okay. So, uh, Christine Monroe Beer. clarify um, I was there for the event that um, transpired um, December 13th about 1020 at night when um, Kenneth Williamson had his accident that he died and uh, there was concern that Dave Meister somehow was the only officer 
available to go and he didn't go, something to that effect. Um, however, I wanted to clarify that the sheriff were actually notified and on site. Um, I know this because I was one of the people that called the sheriff and I was also on site. Um, I was at Peaches that night and one of our employees from the trail came to me and said that there were shots being fired outside on the balcony of Nate and Noel's uh, Hanky's house. And so um, being unclear to what I was, I, I just wanted to ascertain what the, what the problem was. So I went over, immediately called 911, um, and doing so on a cell phone puts you immediately into the sheriff's dispatch as opposed to the YSPD. So when I called, um, the dispatcher was asking me what I was seeing um, when I went out in between the um, in, in between like the Arts Council where the dumpsters are for peaches and the gravel lot and then there's this little um, broken down fence so you weasel behind all that and you come around and in front of the old Williams building there were fireworks being shot off for whatever reason. So I specifically, I'm on the phone, the dispatcher now has me on a three-way call with our YSPD dispatch. So I hear them click into the call, they're both asking me what I see, and I specifically see green and yellow lights, and I hear the pop of the fireworks, and then I hear people saying, oh no, it's just fireworks. <coughs> so I, re I repeat that to the dispatchers and said, okay, you know, I think maybe I've made a wrong phone call and I think this is indeed fireworks. So, you know, and I saw the smoke um, in the street. Um, so feeling quite satisfied that that's in fact what was going on. I turned around, I went into Peaches. Um, I reported back to my bartender. Don't be alarmed, I think this is what this is. Um, within, sorry, with, within just a couple more minutes, um, another person came into the bar and confirmed that no, there was in fact some someone. So, um, thinking that uh, that it was someone I knew, which it turned out not to be, and um, and the concern for the people at Peaches related to the person that I thought it was. I wanted to hurry and get over there to figure out what I was going to do as far as personnel. And when I got there, um, thinking that it was the event was inside, not outside, I just went straight up the stairs. Um, so I was going up the stairs on the balcony, and uh, Colin Altman was already there, and then there was someone else over here in uniform. I followed a sheriff up the steps uh, and there was another person behind me carrying boxes um, which could have been an EMT. I, he didn't have a badge that I saw. So when I got up there my plan was to get back in the back corner of the balcony to figure out who it was and what I needed to do and, and in fact it wasn't inside it was actually right there so um, I was a little stunned for a second and it took me a couple of seconds to um, figure out what I should do. And I backed away and was going to go down and the sheriff said, man, you should probably not be here. So at that time I left, went down onto the front walk and um, was asking people, uh, just random people, uh, who it was and what, you know, what was next. Um, it was several minutes, and then uh, there were sheriff, there were our EMTs, fire trucks. Um, I do remember seeing a state patrol car at some point. I was only down there for maybe 15 minutes. Um, and when I saw Brian Carlson pull up, um, I saw him get out of the car, and I knew, you know, the we were there, and so I felt pretty confident that um, everything was okay, and I went back into Peaches. Later, I told Brian I was there, 
um, and what I had saw, and if he had any questions to get a hold of me. Um, and, uh, and so I was, I was a little taken aback when we read in the paper that Dave Meister, um, the, the, the incident that we, we weren't represented or, you know, there was some confusion about us being there um, or him being alone. Um, but I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that the sheriff was in fact there and then soon after the Ryan was there. Okay. All right, thanks, Christine. Um, okay, uh, Jeff Panrake. Excuse me if I'm a little emotional and a little frightened that we may lose an incredible uh, servant to our community, and I'm a little frustrated that it feels that he's been ongoingly um, about six months ago, Officer Dave Meister was given a series of disciplinary actions for leniency. We all know the story. These actions included that the department was to provide a behavior improvement plan, and that Officer Dave was moved to the 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. shift for the purpose of receiving mentoring from Chief Bryan. To date, Officer Dave has not received any such behavior improvement plan, nor, according to him, has Chief Bryan spent a single minute mentoring him. I have requested and received several personnel files of officers and supervisors, and one glaring issue that I have noticed is a lack of regular yearly performance evaluations as is required by village policy. I would like to know why <clears throat> Chief Bryan's direct supervisor, village manager Patty Bates, has apparently not followed up to monitor Bryan's progress in spending time mentoring Dave, ensuring that the behavior improvement plan was created and being utilized, and that Chief Bryan was performing yearly evaluations and all employees reporting to him. Further, I charge that if it's true that Manager Patty has failed in these vital responsibilities, that she has caused our officers to operate without the feedback and mentoring they both require and deserve to do their jobs, and then unless there is an acceptable explanation that this negligence has caused a threat to the safety of our village. Also, as part of Officer Dave's disciplinary action of last year, was that any future violation of policies could result in termination. Is it any surprise that he was hypersensitive to ensuring that he did not even appear to violate any written policies? The time and attendance policy is very clearly prohibits any unapproved overtime. This is why Officer Dave was so fearful of staying overtime. Is the revolving door of officers any surprise considering this culture of fear in our department. Lastly, if the council was told in the beginning of this situation that Officer Dave sent a rookie officer into this reported self-inflicted shooting all alone, then that is disturbing in the extreme if that's all you were told. We you also told that Officer Paul Rapoul has been an officer here for nine months and that he worked in law enforcement for three years before coming here. He has more full-time law enforcement experience than Brian Carlson had when Patty hired her friend to be our chief. Think about that when you hear Officer Rapool referred to as a rookie. Were you also told that before Officer Dave left the police station, not only did he ensure that YSPD sergeant was on the way, but that he also knew, he heard and knew, that three Greene County deputy sheriffs were either on the scene or on the way, and that MTFR medics who were staging nearby had already been cleared on the radio to approach the secured scene. Only then did Officer Dave know the scene was well staffed and safe, and that is when he left the station to go home. Only then. Thus avoiding being written up for violating the overtime policy. Were you told any of this by Chief Bryan or Patty, our manager? If not, you've got some serious questions to ask. In one second, I fail to see any actual violations of safety that actually occurred here, but I see very clearly an ongoing harassment and bullying of our community's only full-time officer who not only is our neighbor, but acts like one. Okay. Uh, Carlos? Uh, 
My name is Carlos Landaburu. Um, Dave Meister is a good guy. He's a good neighbor. He's a wonderful human human being. He happens to be also a very good police officer. According to Rubor, he stopped a bank robbery, single-handedly. According to the Hero Springs News, if you can believe them, he saved a drowning man all by himself. It's not easy to be a police officer. It's not easy to be a police officer in this town of strong individuals and opinions. It's not easy to be a police officer and be kind and still be respected and do your job. And he has excelled at all of that. We have countless testimonies that show that he is a very, very good cop, very like, very respected. What breaks my heart is that a few influential people that I know for a long time they seem to be okay with the fighting or in favor of housing uh, It's I understand that the decision of fighting Meister is with the village manager. However, since this has caused a lot of, a, a really an upset in, in, in town, a lot of people are very, very upset about this, very disappointed with the political process, disappointed with council, which is supposed to represent us. I urge council to intervene and stop this. I imagine that there is a way that council can tell the village manager to stop the process, and perhaps tell the chief to work with prior, with uh, with a master. I think that we would we are, we would be. All of us, we will be better off if this situation results in some kind of living together between Meister and the people who doesn't like, who don't like, and move on. Um, also, um, for the next village manager, I hope that we did involve a lot of people in the selection process. We have a history of having difficulties in selecting and keeping good village managers. So hopefully the community can help with the next one. And I would say, keep Meister. I mean, he is an asset to the community. Give him a raise. Give him his corporal position back. Be afraid that he can be, he can be pushed by some other employer. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Carlos. Um, Judith Hempling. Hi, Judith Hempling. Um, so I know when I was on the council, I was hated being put in the position you guys are being put in right now, in which you, you know, we our justice system requires that we hear all sides of the story to determine what's true, and yet village co off council is often asked to take sides with an incomplete picture. That's always, that's often the way I felt in these circumstances when I was mm -hmm. in council. Um, but it, it appears to many of the villagers that the administrative staff have made a mistake here about Officer Meister's action during this tragic circumstance. Uh, given what villagers had witnessed and also documented the documented timeline, we know that the 9-11 calls uh, went, to the, went to the county and the, t and the township and that those calls came in between 9-27 and 9-35. According to Miami Township, they were on the scene at 9-35. Sheriffs were there by 9.41. Um, Sergeant Knapp and Chief Carlson uh, were called by dispatch. They could have directed Dave. They, they were in authority. He was actually off of the clock. And they could, have, they could have directed him to go to the scene. They did not. Officer Meister was at the Bryan Center, but off duty. And he correctly believed that a timely and adequate response was taking place. After the fact, he's now being criticized, but it's by the very people who could have given him permission to go, uh, who had the authority uh, to go, to give him that uh, uh, permission. Now the guidelines for village policing, of course we were all part of developing that, um, which is a, is a broadly worded document, 
to inform policy, hiring, training, etc., is being used to justify possible termination, while the specific police department <coughs> policy regarding off-duty officers and the limitations that's put on them by this policy is not being discussed. Uh, just to say a couple of things that it says, uh, it says it basically cautions police officers when they're off duty about getting involved in, uh, in you know, on duty work. It says um, when the safety of the pub public requires immediate action, officers should first consider reported, reporting and monitoring the activity and only take direct action as a last resort. It says any officer prior to taking any off duty enforcement action shall notify and receive approval of a supervisor. And it says there is no legal requirement for off duty official officers to take law enforcement action when they are off duty. So, to me, as we look closer um, at Officer Mark Meister's actions that night, um, to me, they reflect his usual calm, thoughtful, caring, de escalating approach, which reflects his greatest strengths as our most beloved police officer. And I was at a meeting that Teresa Newton over here used to be one of our dispatchers, and I've been sort of like in and talked with her, and she was talking about what an excellent police officer he was. I know, uh, and. And that is three minutes. Okay. And um, I just think there's something obviously not going right in PD, but the fact that the community loves and, and really trusts him, trusts the foundation of the <coughs> safety center policing, I believe, and it really needs to be taken seriously um, to resolve those internal matters and um, retain this excellent police officer. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Judith. Uh, Summer? Summer McGuire. I uh, was a longtime resident. I'm deeply concerned by the actions taken against Dave Meister in the last year or so. Honestly, the previous and current incidences seem to be linked to personal issues from within the department. I think we're all aware of some of that history. That he could be pers possibly terminated for not going on that call when his shift ended and the insured and supervisor and EMTs were on the route leaves me flabbergasted and disgusted. There were plenty of first responders on the scene, as I understand. You all know quite well, Yale Springs Police Department and you, Ms. Bates, have had them under close scrutiny, as we've discussed, for many months now. So to read statements um, by Councilmember Housh and Krieger that he did not act from a place of safety and concern shows perhaps being ill-informed or you know, maybe being part of some sort of agenda um, to push that in a direction. Nothing happens in a vacuum, and thanks to what appears to be a campaign to see him gone, Officer Meister can't simply do an excellent job that he's been doing for years. He also has to think about, what would they say about this decision? Am I following this policy? Do I need permission for this or that? Uh, Krieger's statement uh, that any other issues would be a whole different question, I think is unfortunately naive to the reality that all has been weighing on his shoulders for months. And to say he didn't have safety and concern in mind at all couldn't be farther from the truth. He knows Ken and his family, and he was shocked to find as many of us later were when we heard what happened. Overtime has to be approved. Shift changes have to be approved. Why didn't the supervisor on duty weigh in and guide him as they should? If a fool needed backup, that officer could ask for it, and Meister would have given it if it was requested. It appears that those involved would stop at nothing to see him off the force as these elements are being ignored. And Manager Bates, to read your describing his conduct as willful and wanton neglect of duty was particularly disturbing. He knew the policies about OT didn't have a request for backup, nor a supervisor's permission to work past his shift. New support was on, nearly on the scene, and later even went to the family's home to check on them and offer support. That's above and beyond the call of duty and nothing akin to neglect of any type. Any concerns over policies not implemented in a handful of calls over years of service with YSTPD should far outweigh all the good Officer Meister has done for this village. Over the last several months, I've read account after account in the news heard many stories from villagers about how he's helped them in times of need, each time exemplifying serve and protect beyond call of duty. My family, too, has been grateful for the thoughtful care and concern with which Officer Meister carries out his duties. He was the one who responded when my daughter had a life-threatening seizure a few years ago. He was on the scene with an officer who was new to YS and who had legitimate performance issues. He was benefiting from Dave's mentoring. In his short time on the force here, this person more often than not responded to calls with a heavy hand, escalating rather than de-escalating and containing incidences. But he was teamed with Dave in an effort to give him examples of techniques and skills that exemplify the community-centered policing that best fits a small village like ours. 
As my daughter was pulled out on a stretcher, I sat in shock, adrenaline and fear running through me. She was in great distress, and I'd just given emergency meds for the first time. That officer, who even knew my family personally before joining YSPD, just stood there looking at me. He didn't know what to do, how to respond. You know, skills like that and when kids are involved are unique, but Dave knew what to do. He knew simply sharing words of comfort, offering me his hand to get into the squad was tremendous balm. And two years ago when my husband broke his ankle, he wasn't on a call. He checked in. He asked how he's doing. Several months later, same thing. That's what compassionate community-centered officers do. I'll wrap up quickly. Over the last several years, there's been lots going on in the U.S. law enforcement community, I think we're all aware. In our own village, we've now had a number of concerning incidences. Meister exemplifies so many qualities and characteristics of how a great officer cares about the community should be. Most of us here try to do our part to be community-minded and honor those who have built this town to be a wonderful progressive community it once was, and I hope is still trying to be. And particularly many hold dear that powerful horse man, quote, be ashamed to die until you've won some victory for humanity. Compassionate, safety-minded, Dave Meister has served the village as officer in EMT and has been very much in line with those values for me. The recent actions of those who have brought charges against him and who have misrepresented his conduct in such terrible ways fall far short on that quote. In fact, they pretty much come up to be ashamed. I implore each of you to do the jobs you hold with some of the thoughtful excellence Officer Meister uses and drop any attempts to punish him for this recent call. Also, he should soon reach a satisfactory conclusion of the six-month probation period. Lastly, I strongly encourage you all to be mindful that you are each public servants and that the citizens whom you serve are watching and listening intently. We have high expectations for impeccable conduct in resolving this matter. We will certainly make our concerns known and use tools within our village's governance should inappropriate actions be taken. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kate? Kate Mooningham, Village Resident. Well, it's really hard to follow all these well-spoken and, and thoughtful people. Thank you. I just have to say what everyone else has said. I prefer not to follow the police department's actions and every action they take. I prefer to do my job and take care of my family and enjoy my community and not have to ever pay attention to the police who I assume are just doing the, the good work of policemen. But I find that's not true anymore. I've seen videos of officers tasing a mentally ill man and then signing off on it later as being just fine. I've heard dash cam audio of an officer gleefully talking about how high he was after harassing people in front of the gulch and how what a great rush it was as his uh, partner apparently listened on in approval and then talked about how great it was they had aligned the dash cam so none of that incident was reported by the cameras but forgetting they were apparently on audio. This is insane. This is our police force. These are supposed to be our good people and I'm hearing uh, that, I mean that officer no longer there but his partner's still there. And, I personally went to the police last year with a, in crisis and was belittled by an officer and, and told that it was just, you know, my word against theirs and, and told factually incorrect information on the law, which I only found out later when I looked it up. There's stuff going, going on that I don't want to know about. I just want, and, and here's Officer Meister, as everyone has showed, a great officer, exemplary, that he's the one in trouble. You know, he didn't, you know, so much has happened, and this office just says, oh, we're going to sign off on this, no big deal, we'll have some training, you know, and go through some training, and everybody's good. And yet, Officer Meister is in trouble. I don't understand it, I don't like it, I don't want to live in a community where this is acceptable. And that's, I guess, for you, Patty, because you're the one whose decision is coming down to, I don't understand it. It's baffling me, it's a baffle summer, and I wish that things would change. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kate. Um, that's everyone I had on the list. Uh, Jackie? Hi, Mike. This is, I'm Jackie Anderson. I'm a village resident. My kids have been so patient. My little one has been patient on his birthday, so put that on the minute. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, I am here to speak on behalf of Officer Meister as well, but I'm also here to speak on behalf of all of you as uh, those who are entrusted to carry out our local uh, government. Um, you are you chose your jobs or you accepted your election based on your desire to carry out the public good and to support public trust. 
and you are all doing the best that you can. I choose to believe in my heart to carry out the public good. You carry out the public good by enacting ordinances and by putting in place uh, laws and by making sure that policies are there to protect the public good. But when carrying out the public good has an opposite effect on public trust, as is the case right now in this situation with our police force and specifically <coughs> with dear Officer Meister, something is broken. Something is broken and it's not one individual. Something in the system that is meant to serve and protect <laughs> the public good and the public trust is broken because doing one is depleting the other. And I charge all of you Go back to the drawing board. You have, a, you have a little bit of time left, Manager Bates, um, in your tenure here. And we're so, I wouldn't do your job for all the money in the world. I really wouldn't. Somebody asked me about it recently and I said, no, thank you. Um, however, you have a little bit of time left in the job that you're doing that is a hard and thankless job, except let me say thank you. Let me say thank you. I ask you, to go back to the reasons you chose this work, to serve public good and also public trust, and find a way to make them both work together for the healing of this community and also for the benefit of a good, good neighbor and a good man and a great officer. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jackie. Uh, any other comments? My name is Ken O'Leorn. Um, the council has the power to end the harassment of Officer Meister. Now, I believe that it does. I call upon the council to vote unanimously to end the bogus investigation and performance review uh, and its transparent efforts to discredit the <laughs> service to our community. Communication from the village manager appeared to be no less or more than a vendetta, an effort to remove him from the force on false pretenses. Stop it. Patty, stop it. Drop it. Chris, tell them to stop. In the best interest of the city, village, and themselves. All right, thanks, Ken. Any other comments? So, my name is Jim Wonky. Uh, I do live here in Yellow Springs. I moved here this past August. I live on 352 Dayton Street. Um, let me say that I am also in support of Dave Meister, uh, even having a short history here. And I apologize to all of my fellow citizens here in Yellow Springs that I'm changing the subject to a different subject very quickly. I don't mean to impact your passion by doing that, but this is something I need to try to get out. I'm on the board of directors for the Big Brothers Big Sisters of the Miami Valley. Some of you may have seen in this week's paper uh, an interview discussion with Donna Pitstick-Holler and Gray Chambers, who is uh, an Antioch student. We are trying to bootstrap up a youth mentoring program for the village of Yellow Springs uh, in partnership with the two of them and Big Brothers Big Sisters. We are having this Sunday at the Emporium from three to five a coffee and learn for you to come learn about youth mentoring, uh, for you to learn about the difference uh, that four hours a month helping a child who doesn't have a consistent presence of a good adult role model, the difference that it can make in the life trajectory of that child. You may think that, well, in Yellow Springs, we don't have any at-risk youth. We do have many at-risk youth. Um, and we need a program like this in this community. So if you want to learn about this program, we're not going to pressure you into doing anything you don't want to. But if you just want to come and learn some of the statistics about how we can change the life of children through a very small amount of time from a caring adult, <clears throat> come to the Emporium Sunday, uh, 3 to 5, and you'll get a free coffee uh, and learn about that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Peggy. Peggy Coburnett, 
I guess that's good, a good segue, thank you. Regarding our youth in town, I've lived here since 1975, and I have always known who our police officers are. They're visible, they're on the street. Now, I only know two of them. And that doesn't go well for the way we're doing policing in a village where we purport to have community policing. It's also a, the segue for the youth because from what I hear at the high school with all this stuff that was going on last year, the people, the youth, the officer that they trust is Dave Meister. And we'll get back to our situation. If it was critical for Officer Meister to have been down there at 40th Street, why was he not requested to go there? How could he have made that decision on his own to say, okay, I'm off duty. I know I can't go do anything, but I'm going to go because I think the jeopardy of the people in the community are at stake here. Do we really think he would jeopardize the safety of the community? That's what you're implying. And I beg you to think differently. We want to be safe here. We want to know our officers. Look inside. What is going on that we don't know them now? Are we becoming more of an alienated bedroom community where there's anonymity and do not know the details? That's when your crime goes up. So what's uh, special about living here? Why do seniors want to live here in the five-story high-rise? If no one knows anything, we have to keep our compassion and we have to maintain knowing who we are, and that's how we keep this community safe. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Yes. Speak into the mic. Yeah, and speak up. No, you I actually don't want to speak straight into it. Get real close because it booms. It, it'll pick you up. You is, it, just is it working properly right now? Mm -hmm. No. No. Okay. no. Um, it doesn't broadcast. It's even. Yes, I, want, I wanted to uh, step up here also in support of Dave Meister. Um, and I want to remind um, council, as everyone else has, that um, Dave Meister is one of two of our police officers that even live in this town, that know this town. There has been incidents of police officers um, in this town pulling a gun on an elder that has been in this town forever that made a mistake. Um, to me, that's unsafe. Um, if you want, if you want to address safety, why don't we talk about who we trust? Trust is safety. Having trust in our police officers, which is a rare thing in this country, and we have trust in Dave Meister. So that's one thing. Is 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 the question of safety? Um, if you have not one but two sheriffs on the scene. You have an e the, the fire department on the scene, and you have a police officer on the scene, and the chief of police on the way. Seems to me that things are covered and things are safe. You have an officer who's worked all day, went on a call, from my understanding, on overtime. He, on, he was in, in asked to, to do that, to go ahead and go, go on a call, went on a call. I, from what my understanding is, is he was on a call for an hour and a half of overtime as it was. I, I may be, I, I don't know that for a fact, but that's my understanding. He's already worked another an hour and a half overtime, and he's off the clock, he's waiting to see, should I go? 
but he's also, it seems to me, with the disciplinary action that was taken, what you see in him is a respect for the authority. Not just taking upon himself, oh, I'm going to go back on the clock, waiting for a supervisor. Whose responsibility is it about the safety? It's the supervisor's uh, job to send him Ooh, back into, minutes, okay. to further overtime after he's already clocked out. So I just, I feel like this is, this is, I don't understand why this is even coming up. It just, it seems like it's, there's something else going on here. And I think yeah. after we talk about that, after we talk about this and clear this up, we need to address the attacks on this officer. And, and we need to look more deeply into what might be going on there. Because that, personally for me, that's what makes me feel unsafe. And I really appreciate the way that you're listening, all of you, very intently to, to the villagers and I hope that you will um, really reconsider that maybe we didn't have all the information, we didn't have the, all the data before we um, jumped to a conclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, any, yes. The mic is off. The mic is off. It's, got, it's not green. Yeah, it doesn't broadcast to the room. So no, but the, she's so saying the live stream can't hear it. They're telling us that they can't hear it. So it, 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 it's showing us on the screen over there that it's coming through the live stream. So I'm not sure. There are a lot of a lot of people don't get audio. So. <coughs> okay. That's um, Officer Meister is someone who I trust as a human being. He showed up for a friend of mine when she was in a mental health crisis, and he talked to her in a really caring way and made all the difference in the world for her. And um, he was at nonviolent communication when we held the, when Diane Diller taught at the Presbyterian Church. And to me, that's exemplary, and I would love to see other good human beings who had his spirit doing that kind of work and learning nonviolent communication. And I trust him, and I'd like to see more officers in the village that I can trust in the same way as I trust Officer Meister. Can you give me your name? I'm sorry. Oh, my name is MJ Gentile. Thanks, MJ. Um, any other comments? Yes. Hi, my name is Maria Thornton. Um, I was here earlier and left, so I'm not sure what all everybody else said. Um, I've been a mother in Yellow Spring Schools for 22 years, and I've never had any trouble under my roof, so I haven't had a lot of interaction with Yellow Springs police overall. I've just been barely acquainted with um, Dennis Nipper and Naomi Watson. Oftentimes that they'd call me asking if my home could be a safe space for someone else, actually. But um, Officer Meister is my neighbor, and I consider them uh, friends and neighbors. Um, they uh, are really a wonderful family, and they're, Officer Meister is the only officer I've ever, living in the village over 20 years, that I've ever felt like I actually know and love him. And I think he's a good human being who cares about our community. Also, he's the only officer I'd ever trust to like actually give intelligence to. And I, and I don't think I'm the only person to say that. But I mean, the kids trust him. The kids have told me things that I would tell him and no one else. So I think that that, that should be considered. I was really disheartened when I opened up the newspaper a couple of weeks ago to see that this was happening to him. It seemed to me like an officer being reprimanded for, for um, being off duty and expecting to be on duty makes absolutely no sense to me at all. Like how, and furthermore, if that were the case then in the future, then our officers would be reprimanded and potentially terminated because then they were uh, off duty, but in fact were expected to be on duty. It just seems like a line that, it seems like a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yes. Right. Yeah. And yeah. manufactured yeah. situation to me. And I mean, and before they were reprimanding him for being too lenient or whatever, it just seems to me like 
Uh, now he's trying to tighten up the ropes, and now he's going to be reprimanded again. It makes absolutely no sense to anyone. So this, reading it again and again in the newspaper, I just was shocked to find that this is that this off-duty officer is being reprimanded for, for in fact, not being on duty. It absolutely is mind-boggling. It seems to me like some sort of vendetta going on with someone who has it out to get him, and I don't know what the story is there, but I think mean, we as a community care about him. He's the only one that a lot of people trust. So I really think it would be a great mistake for the village to let the hand go. There, there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Sharon. If you think about the incident that happened with Dr. Agnon, you know, I think that policeman was responding to the training he's had, and that frightens me. And the only uh, policeman in this town that I'm not afraid of is David Meister. And if I had a problem and I couldn't call him, I might not call him. Thanks, Sharon. Yes. Um, okay, Amy? Magnus. I've talked about 16 years as a resident of Yale Springs at this point. Uh, the last 11 years uh, I've lived on Brookside. Uh, Dave Meister has um, been a welcome sight on many occasions. And I want to point out a couple of things. As many of you know, I'm in the Air Force and I study security issues. And one thing that's made very clear is that in sensitive situations, you can have too many cooks in the kitchen, you can have too many police officers on a scene. And I think that what we're hearing here is that somebody is being called out again for exercising discretion in a way that I think most of our instincts would go, right? Is that this officer had been on duty for a long period of time, he was off duty, he did not, according to the policy, um, uh, as Judith pointed out, have discretion to enter into the scene. And there were a lot of people already there or on the way. And it's important that people exercise appropriate restraint in these situations. And that's what I see in day again and again. He's talked me down when I got really upset about something. He was a real calming force. And I have to see when I open that paper, I mean because I think a few of us were expecting for a shoe to drop here at some point. But this was a wound in the community that I really feel was disrespected. This tragedy is not a place for political maneuvering. Yes. This is excruciating. This tears at trust. It tears at it. I need you to think, and I need you to think hard because I live here. I have dedicated myself to this town. And this hurts. Roberts and uh, I think um, our uh, police chief Brian Carlson has a, um, a personnel conflict 
and uh, there are factions and allegiances, I guess. And I'm, I'm very compassionate for poor Chief Carlson. How can he unify this conflict within the department? I don't know. But I think he's going to have to figure out something besides this. Because as you've heard, it's just not fair. It's not right. It's not good. It's, it's not. Uh, it's certainly not what this community wants. So it's a challenge. I'm just gonna have to figure something else out. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, any other comments? Yes. My name is Erica Talbot. I've had a Yellow Springs address for eight years, but I've only lived in the village since March. Um, and the only officer that I know well is Officer Meister, and he's been to my home when I had my dad with um, mental health issues. He had to call 911, and he was there to comfort our family. Um, and I gotta say, like Amy said, and a lot of other people have said, when I opened up the paper and saw Ken's name associated with the things that are happening with Officer Meister, that was very painful for me. My daughter is very good friends with Ken's daughter, and I just can't imagine feeling like my job was on the line because someone who's my neighbor and my friend making me feel like I didn't do my job to be there for my friend in the last moments of his life. So instead, I went to his home and comforted his wife and child. And now somehow my job is on the line because of that, I just cannot imagine. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, more. My name is Lauren Moore. Um, obviously, the community um, feels very strongly about um, Dave Meister for many, many years. I don't know Dave that well. I know him through the fire department, and I know his EMT skills that um, are, are very needed in the community. But could, what I, could you speak up, Lauren? I know they're having a hard time sure. hearing the feed. I'm is this any better? Probably it is. Okay. It's not us, it's the people who are listening. Yeah, no, I understand. Thank you. Um, what I'm struck by is that it seems like that there may have been um, a personnel management plan that's probably not the right words for it, but you know, kind of like, this is what you need in order to, to do better, to be considered that you're doing your job in a way that better meets our goals and our objectives for you in this position. And if an individual is not getting mentorship, is not getting counseling, is not getting uh, training to see those things move in that direction, then, then the management is at fault for not doing that. You may have, you know, absolutely appropriate things that you have concerns about, but if you're not helping him correct those behaviors, then you are at fault. I'm also concerned about how much this is gonna cost the village in terms of lawsuits, uh, either by, uh, you know, department, um, or, or, um, uh, uh, Meister, you know, his, his rights for uh, uh, litigation, as well as maybe other people. And I'm concerned about what may be the other agenda. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Um, okay. I think that uh, we will wrap up citizen comments. Heard a lot of uh, important things. And um, do council members have things that they want to say? <laughs> Yeah, did you want to go into it? Um, if, if you think that those I, I don't know. I mean, I could say are, a few things. Sure. So, um, I, I just, I've been writing down what people have said and writing down my thoughts about that. Clearly, everyone here, at least everyone who's expressed themselves, has uh, great trust and, I'll say, love for Dave Meister. And um, implied or, or, or stated, do not trust or do not know the other officers. 
And that's a problem for the department, clearly. My sense also, this, this idea of this hidden agenda, vendetta, um, I have no knowledge of that, nor do I believe that it is happening. And I can't imagine, frankly, what it would be like to be Patty Bates. Because it would sure be a lot easier to just bypass this. You think she's having fun? And, and just so you know, this kind of expression is appropriate. But she's had her tires punctured three times since this happened. And that is not appropriate. And that is not how I think we should be responding. That, that is a violent act. So if I were Patty Bates and I wanted to just get along with everyone, I sure would not. I would have just done exactly what you said, just dismiss this and let this go on. So there, as far as I'm concerned, there is no vendetta. This is not something that she or Chief Carlson are like, whoa, whoa, let's do this. And we have a problem. We have a problem of trust by you all in our police department. I would say my sense is you ha don't have very much trust of council either, even though all we are is we're just like, oh, okay, well, that's good to know. Good to know. I, I was, I've gotten that sense from some of the letters that I've read. Um, I think we need to do some things. Um, I'm not going to talk about, I mean, beyond Meister, I think, uh, I mean, one thing I've thought of is having like a state of the village meeting where we have a, a council meeting is not a time where we can really sit down and have back and forth conversation. So that's one thing I thought. Another thing I thought and have said is we need to have our officers be visible to the community and the community needs to know the officers. And we need to have a department where they feel like they can trust each other. And what's happening now, and I'm not assigning blame to anyone, is not helping the situation. And, and I mean, I don't have to tell anyone, this is a very difficult situation. And I think that's about all I have to say. Okay. Uh, Kevin, Lisa? Well, I, I would just say that I do uh, appreciate all the comments. Um, it, it, it does make a difference. I mean, you all coming out, showing up, sharing your thoughts. Um, I echo uh, everything Marianne said, um, especially the, the police officers being more visible. Um, I mean, because I, other than working with them here, you know, I don't have opportunity to run into a lot of officers. But yeah, the, the conversation I had with someone uh, over the weekend, you used the phrase a beat cop, you know, just out walking the beat. And, um, you know, we, I think we do need more of that. Um, and again, not to just take up because we, uh, we, we've spent a lot of time, I don't want to belabor the point, uh, but I would echo uh, Marianne's comments and I do appreciate your concern and appreciate your comments. Okay. Lisa? Yeah. So I, I, I appreciate hearing from, from you this evening and also from um, the many people who have written us letters and have also taken the time to talk with me one on one. It's been very important, and um, although you may not trust the council, I can personally say that I am certainly listening, and that that facts really matter to me, as well as understanding the impact that individuals have had. Um, I made a statement to the paper, and as a result then have been listening more to what people have to say, and part of taking the risk of making a statement to the paper is to just get a point of view out there that will draw people also to share additional information. That's part of the going back and forth. So um, I guess personally I would say, you know, communicate with me. As, as a council person, it's my job to represent you. And it's also my job to, as much as possible, understand what the facts are. And I think, I mean, I, one thing that concerns me is the, what people are saying implies that you know, this is a done deal or that decisions have been made and that is not my impression at all. And that instead the goal is to have an extremely neutral look at this that's not being done by 
patty or I mean it's, it's done by a completely neutral um, process that should help I would hope to mitigate some of these concerns about you know insider vendetta that sort of thing um, later in this agenda um, council person <laughs> Kenetta and I are going to talk about our plans to um, launch the new justice system commission and at the heart of what we want to do is is to improve the relationships and trust between the YSPD and the council and you and and that's going to take time and so a lot of these ideas that you've had I, we I really we really appreciate and and we'll need your involvement with that too it's very clear that we have a serious issue and so thank you for sharing your perspectives but do know that I do support an investigation thank you uh, Kenetta yeah um, I just would like to say that um, along with Lisa we um, are going to be talking about our launch plan for the Justice System Commission um, I do believe that that at the core of that is community policing and I think that <clears throat> to have a standard for that I think that's really important um, I also think that it's important for us to kind of understand um, how we can draw in that community policing. Um, at the beginning of Citizens Concerns, I wrote down um, money to support police officers. As we know, affordability is an issue. And so when we are looking at um, bringing in police officers who would be able to live here, we have to look at that piece as a part of that. Um, but yeah, I. I completely agree with what Lisa said and I agree with my fellow council members that um, this is a difficult situation and that we are taking in all of the facts to be able to make um, an informed opinion about that. Okay, so I'll just wrap up with a few things because um, I think a lot has been said uh, and, um, and we've all been thinking about this a lot and uh, I appreciate the uh, citizen interaction with any kind of issue like this because it's important for us to uh, get perspective, keep perspective. Um, clearly, there are a couple things that I think we all agree on. Dave Meister is a great guy, no doubt about it. And my interactions with him as an officer have also been great. And uh, the feedback I get about Meister and the things I see him do and his compassion and his caring, uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I think the other thing that we can all agree on is that discipline is not something that is easy to get involved in and it's very complicated. And the third thing that becomes more and more clear is the huge disconnect and uh, I appreciate the, this kind of sense that we need to figure this out. I will say that it has been the work that has been going on since before I was on council. It continues to go on. Uh, lots of the letters and comments reflect that um, this is an ongoing effort and we have to continuously improve. But there are some things that need to be figured out. Uh, I agree with Mary Ann. I don't believe in the nefarious plots. Um, I also do not think that, uh, I just can't even really, it doesn't make any sense to me that there's any political posturing here. I mean, what, what would we gain out of this um, other than uh, a lot of disruption when there are so many things that are important, including a good police department? Um, but what I do think is there are problems with communication there's something to unravel here, and, uh, and we're all really concerned. The last thing I want to say that underscores what Lisa pointed out is no council member has said anything about termination, all right? So jumping to those conclusions is not something that anyone should do, and council is in a difficult position because, as we've talked about many times, it is not technically within our purview under the charter to be so actively involved in policing. However, as everyone knows, we have been very actively involved because of situations that have occurred and that continue to occur. 
And so I think that also means that um, we will be looking at what's going on very carefully. Uh, I have my own opinions about uh, how this should be resolved and resolution orientation is what I think is most important here. How do we figure out how to get things on track, keep things on track, um, and it's not easy. But at the end of the day, we listen very carefully and we are tracking this. We're going to continue to be involved. Um, I'm sorry about the bad feelings that have come out of this. Um, there's, you know, we're not going to get into, I don't think, the, the details and going through the timeline because this is beyond like the facts and minutia, really. And it's more about a feeling that we have as a community. And uh, that's what we need to get to the heart of and resolve. And that's what we're going to continue to work on. So, do, do you or do we want Chris to say what has happened and what, how it's supposed to roll out? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My body um, let, me, let me just kind of explain. I think Lisa addressed this about the. the process part of it because I think it's important that everybody understand um, how the handbook works and that there's due process built into that when that handbook was created and adopted by a council iterations ago by the Judith Council President then. Um, the, the mandate from council was that the council wanted to see protections put in place for the employees. So the fact that there has been a, an investigation initiated that is a, it's a, it begins a process where an employee is put on notice to say there is information that is uh, not within the knowledge of a uh, manager of an office. In this case, it happens to be the village manager that says we have to look into it. It is then that employees have given notice that there is an event or a series of events that has occurred and then there is an investigation done. In this case, there was an investigation done by an outside agency to determine, yes, there is a factual basis to go forward with a disciplinary process. That process includes an opportunity for a hearing where that individual employee can present evidence, much like a trial scenario, and bring in witnesses to present evidence to rebut factual claims that the investigator says that it exists. And Officer Meister will have that opportunity. There will be a hearing officer who is not a village employee, that is a neutral, and that hearing officer then will listen, will determine if there's evidence presented that refutes factual allegations that are contained in the report, if there's facts that mitigate potential discipline that could exist in light of the history that we have here, and then that report will be given to the village manager. The village manager does not take part in this process. The village manager is on the outside of the process. And at which point, with that information, whatever it may turn out to be, um, a decision will be made one way or another on what the appropriate action is uh, that will be taken. And, um, and once that process is done, the individual employee has another layer of processes uh, that uh, he or she could, could undertake. But right now, um, there is no decision that's been made. Um, there's a, a complicated, I'll address this because there were some discussions by, uh, by folks about what the fact pattern is. You gotta understand that a scene where there's a shooting and there's multiple 911 calls coming in, there, there's, there's different timelines because there's dynamic action going on. You have multiple dispatchers that are receiving phone calls of 911. We had reports that there were fireworks. We had another report that there were gunshots. There were reports that were coming in from people who were not at the scene and other reports that were coming in. And that, that information is being pushed out, some of which is accurate, some of which is not. And sometimes it's difficult in real time, as all of you know, to know what's accurate and what's not. So this is an evolving process. The pre-disciplinary hearing process is not that, that no date has been set. Um, information is still being provided to Officer Meister and his lawyer because they're requesting additional information. 
Uh, we will not go forward until this lawyer is comfortable that he's received all the information that he's asked for. Um, and, uh, and I can assure you that, that counsel will, I know they will mandate it, and I know the patty will insist on it as well, that um, one of my jobs is to make sure that the process is fair. Because frankly, if the process is unfair, that provides the basis for the legal challenges that I think somebody talked about. Um, if there were an outcome that would lead to some uh, disciplinary action that, that, uh, that Officer Meister would object to. So um, it's still an early stage, and uh, I simply would ask people to have an open mind and, and wait for this to play out as it may be. <coughs> I don't know if that leads to any questions from counsel or me. Thanks, and, and Thanks, Chris. Chris, and I, I would just want to emphasize um, just a couple of things. As a result of the events that occurred, you know, there was um, enough concern uh, to, you know, consider whether there should be an investigation. And I think one thing that, and I, I don't, I'm not on Facebook and I don't see a lot of what's happening, but I, every now I dip my toe in and, 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 and hear things, um, you know, Whereas, you know, we're given a lot more responsibility and blame, I'm saying all of us up here, responsibility and blame, if you will, than what we're actually responsible for. And I think, again, what's key is where there was enough concern, I think one, one thing that needs to be emphasized is that an outside agency, can we say who it was? Well, Clark County, Clark County, <laughs> there was a deputy sheriff from Clark County assigned uh, to do the, the investigation. And uh, then there will be a process selected, uh, and um, I will uh, be talking to uh, uh, Officer Meister's attorney, and we'll talk about a hearing officer. Um, while we have the ability to, to solely choose anyone we want, we could be trying to find somebody that's mutually acceptable. Uh, and I expect that, that will happen here. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Um, and let's take a five minute break as people uh, sort of exit. <laughs> Okay, give me some minutes. Yeah. Okay. I was going to pass a note. Did I? Like, what happened? Why is that not working? Did you? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you submit anything in writing about this? No. No, no, no. No, no. Okay. I'm just going to blab and then uh, oh, okay. get some consensus and then to see whether, uh, uh, give by the care, see yeah, whether I had a lady email me, I asked her to, to, to dig okay. deeper. Brian knows. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, it was, I think that's what I was asked to do. Okay, so I think we're going to bring the meeting back to Thank order. You for the minute. <laughs> yes. And uh, I understand that we did have a mic issue, which has now uh, been fixed. <laughs> uh, so apologize for that technical difficulty. No. And I think, Sandy, you wanted to close out with something? Yes, I had um, two other citizen concerns. Um, they're two different things. Um, the first one is uh, I wanted to bring before council the possibility of two hitching posts um, within town. Um, one downtown, um, I need a, a place where I can hit, hitch her, a hitching rail, not a hitching post, a hitching rail, um, so that I can um, hitch uh, her when I'm downtown getting groceries or if I have to go to the restroom, I have a place where I can just stop. And um, the second one, I was I was hoping to do somewhere around um, the Yellow Springs Dharma Center and um, the um, Quaker Meeting House because I, I meditate there quite often, and that's a, a a good place for her to be. And there's actually a green space in there where I feel like if we put a little gravel in part of that area that she could be hitched right there and it would be out of the street and it would, it, you know, it might, you know, the mowing might be a little bit different, but I think that that might be a, a spot that would be helpful. 
Okay. Um, so I wanted to suggest those two things as just two hitching reels. We have, we have um, in town many uh, handicapped spaces. We have many parking spaces for cars. We have um, places for bicycles. They, they even um, cordoned off part of the um, area for motorcycles this summer. And I feel like um, one hitching rail for whoever might come to town and need to hitch. Um, you never know, this could be a trend. Hey, Brian Howard. <laughs> so um, I would like for this to be considered. Um, the, the, I've, I've heard Brian um, Howard uh, bring up the fact that we want alternative transportation. Active transportation. And this is about as alternative as you can get. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I would like to have some support for that. So that was the first thing. And then the second thing was um, I also wanted to encourage council to consider a proclamation um, of um, a conscientious objector day in Yellow Springs that could be acknowledged every year. Um, because we have many um, people in our town that have been conscientious objectors. We have many peacemakers. Um, we have Veterans Days, and that's all fine and good, but I think that it needs to be acknowledged that it's really brave, and it's actually extra brave, in my view, um, to be a conscientious objector and to go up against um, harsh uh, situations like Martin Luther King did and Gandhi did um, nonviolently and refusing to um, take up military arms to force your way. There so I would, like to, I would like to see if, if we could um, have a conscientious <coughs> objector day. And I was thinking at the end of January, January 27th was the day that my father passed away. And I would like maybe, I don't know if it needs to be a specific day or not, but okay. um, that was my request. All right, thank, thank you, Sandy. You. Thank you for your time. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we're going to move into special reports, and we have uh, still our current treasurer, Rachel McKinley, here. What, what do you want? Yes? Um, so, Rachel, take it away. All right. Um, as I'm still the current pre uh, treasurer, but I have submitted my notice. Um, and uh, I leave, I think, with... Um, our situation in a great spot. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of good things that have happened in the last few years with the markets going up for the kinds of things that we could invest in. And the fact that um, staff was able to part with some of the money that was sitting in checking and finally agreed we have a new finance director who I think is excellent and was able to um, accommodate some more investments. Um, so therefore, you know, we've seen great performance uh, compared to previous years for multiple reasons. But that, you know, those two, the market's going up and the fact that we now have more money to invest, obviously, was a huge factor. Um, I leave with the following recommendations. Um, I, I feel strongly that we should participate in the Ohio Online Checkbook Transparency Program that is recommended by the Ohio Treasurer's Office. Uh, um, the Miami Township folks are doing this. Most of the other communities seem to be partaking in this. When I go to my annual meetings, as required for my job. Um, there's a lot of buzz about it. Um, it seems to be really popular among uh, citizen groups. <coughs> and so I provided in my letter of resignation a link to that. Um, my second recommendation is to uh, develop an investment strategy that includes forecasting short-term and long-term cash flow needs. This is something that I've had a, a bit of a heavy lift trying to get from, and I know it's not easy because change, you know, there's a lot of things competing for your dollars, um, but it really would help 
to maximize your investment potential to have those timelines in place. So, um, I estimate that if we were able to have some of those uh, longer term investments in our portfolio, we could maybe make an additional maybe 7,000 a year, you know, sort of back of the envelope calculation. Not a lot of money, but it's, it's significant maybe. Um, and then finally, one of the best classes that I attend when I go to these annual um, trainings that are offered by the, secretary, the, uh, the state treasurer's office is an ethics um, class. Uh, and their speaker is by far the most dynamic speaker of, of these meetings. And they have to offer multiple classes because this person's so popular. And she is willing to go to any community that asks, um, and, and she's excellent. And it's something that I've always thought would be a great fit for this community. So I just thought I'd throw that out. Um, again, I've uh, got a link on that. And it's free, mm -hmm. so I like that too. Um, so finally, <coughs> I think that at this point, um, last year we made over 90, thousand dollars off of our investments this n upcoming year I would imagine will will make probably more because we just transferred a half a million from the checking into uh, star so I think it looks good I think uh, you're in good shape all right thank you thank you great okay. uh, yeah any go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say two things. Uh, first of all, I have talked to Colleen already about Open Checkbook. Um, she did participate in Open Checkbook at her last position, and she would love to get that up and running. The initial entry of the data is very time consuming, so it's something that's going to take her a little time to get up and running. And then after that, it's really simple to enter it annually. Um, and so that is something that we're planning on. Great. And um, the ethics, I bet we know exactly who you're talking about yeah. because we had Susan, a... Susan Wilkie. Wilkie. Yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a, a, a village, all village employees were required to attend last oh. year. And we hope to have annual uh, refreshers with her because she is wonderful. Yeah. So. And I would encourage everybody, even, you know, treasurers and council people and everybody mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Rachel? No. Thank you for yeah. your service. Yes. yes. Thank, thank you, you so thank much, you. Rachel. And uh, yeah, thanks for pushing on the investment piece. Uh, I think that's uh, making a really important difference. So, okay. Um, we've got some old business items. Uh, the first one being uh, Kevin. I guess you're going to do some follow up on transient guest lodging. Yeah. I wish the big group were still here. I'd take right. a poll and say, who's <laughs> interested in transit guests? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so I, was, I was asked to um, do a report, and I said I would, but I, I had an epiphany okay. while I was putting the information together. <clears throat> you know, I, I initially was concerned about this when I knew, you know, personally the names, faces, and work and coworkers, you know, who were living in an apartment, and then when the lease ended, they were asked to leave, and that place was flipped over to uh, transient lodging. And so, I know of three different uh, places. Um, and so that's, and so I was asked to sort of take that information, sort of report out on that. So first of all, Patty did a great job with the report, and there's really not a whole lot. Maybe there is a whole lot, but I, I wasn't, I, my intention was not to try to add a whole lot to that. What I'm hoping to do is make sure that most of us are in agreement that this is something that needs to be looked in, you know, more seriously. And, and I would ask at the end of, of the very short comments I'm going to have, um, you know, whether planning commission uh, maybe ought to take this on or I don't know that it would necessarily fit in the complete purview of the Housing Advisory Board, but I think planning, I think they would both have a role, but maybe in terms of what we can actually do that makes sense, uh, maybe the planning um, commission needs to, needs to take a look at it. So, 
so I'm, you know, I've done a little bit of research, and there's lots of communities that are starting to do a lot of things to try to keep in check the growth of transient lodging. Um, and so the epiphany that I had was, first of all, there was like three or four places where I knew personally people that were being impacted by that. But then when I looked at the list that we have from last, uh, from the previous meetings packet, there's 33 properties on there. And now granted, some of them were where a separate structure was built on someone's property. Some of them are in uh, uh, the home of the owner. And so I was not able to get the information to be able to segment those. But if I were to guess, I would say out of those 33 that 20 of them, being very conservative, that 20 of them, before this all started, that there were 20 of these places that were either homes or apartments that were available. And my experience has just been in the last year when I've been able to see it. So I, I didn't want to just start with what I've observed. I wanted to look at the entire population. So given that we have 33, res 33 locations that have requested uh, transit guest lodging permits, um, and that number changes sometimes because of, I think, the way that we find them. They, they pop up, or we expect folks to sort of self-report, mm -hmm. and uh, folks are busy and forgetful, and, and so they report a little later sometimes. So, <clears throat> so given that, all of that, I think, again, it's a bigger problem than, than I even considered. Because, again, I only knew about three or four. But almost all of the 33, you know, were places, you can imagine, that at one point were apartments or homes so, that were available to the public. So just real quick, I'll just mention a couple of things that, that other cities are doing. Um, so some of the cities, you know, you'll, you hear some big ones, and of course it makes a, a big difference because uh, a lot of these places are much larger than, a bit much larger than us, but we are a small village that we're starting to have to inherit some of these uh, large city problems. Los Angeles, New York, Mallorca, Spain, uh, Barcelona, Spain, Charleston, South Carolina, San Francisco, New Orleans, Reykjavik, Iceland, Las Vegas. I mean, these are places that are really starting to crack down on short-term short -term lodging because it's starting to get out of control. Uh, some of the things that Patty mentioned uh, in her report, just as suggestions, there's several other things that could be done, but one, uh, I'll just read through a couple of bullets, a few bullets, make owner-occupied properties eligible uh, for the transient guest lodging. That means only uh, owner occupied, not where you buy a house, you, you live over here on this side of town, but you buy this house on this side and make it a, a transient guest lodging applica application. Um, that's something we could, we could consider doing. And again, I want to reiterate, just want to, I want to get the interest, engage the interest, you know, of council to want to have something done, and then we have a, a body like maybe planning commission to really dig down and look at the whole body of possibilities and what would make sense. Um, you know, something like the fact that uh, Glass Farm. Uh, we, we've already said, well, Glass Farm, all utilities are going to be underground. There won't be any utility poles over there. Maybe we could just make a decision that no transit lodging on any properties in Glass Farm. I don't know. Um, th that's a thought, to do it from a zone, from a zone by zone perspective. Um, you know, we've got the 3% lodging tax. You know, some communities, their transit lodging tax is as high as 14% and, and probably even higher. One thing, that, uh, one thing that's done is to limit the number of nights that your property is available in a year. Some folks go as little as 30 days, some up to 180 days, and some, some no limits. Um, I think New York is an example where they've put a moratorium on all apartments being uh, transit guest lodging, but you're still allowed to do it in a single family home. Um, our registration fee is $25. Mm -hmm. Some communities, the registration fee is $1,000 to be able to do that. Um, you know, so again, there's just the, it, those types of things, and you can, you can look at the, uh, uh, the report that Patty did last week. I don't want to say, spend a lot of time because we're, we're over, but again, I just wanted us uh, to, to 
get the conversation going. I, you know, if other council members want to share any of their experiences, and, and then uh, maybe we can again uh, de decide whether it should be moved forward I, to another body. I have a suggestion. Okay. That the Housing Advisory Board write up a, uh, a suggested policy statement. Mm -hmm. That we include the Economic Sustainability Commission in that statement because mm -hmm. this is because this is an enter this is mm -hmm. does provide people with mm -hmm. business income. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we bring this back to council. We advertise uh, and send out notices to all 30 three people that have Airbnb. I mean, I think we've agreed anything would be grandfathered in. I mean, maybe we haven't agreed that, but I thought that that's probably it. But at any rate, uh, start off with something and then invite people to come in and have a special council meeting. I mean, not a special council meeting, but a time devoted to that council mm -hmm. meeting. Um, and uh, I didn't hear planning commission mentioned in that loop, but well, I think that would... Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, Planning Commission, th then it would go to Planning Commission probably to get written into the zoning, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely would want us, I like the idea of us um, sort of formalizing this proposal. Or it could be vetted by Planning Commission, too, right. before it comes to council. But I'd like some guidance from us on this. Um, okay, uh, Eric, were you here to speak about this, or? Uh, well, uh, you have an opportunity to if you'd like. Um, yeah, I was actually here from Meister, but what the heck, I'll stick around. Okay, Eric Clark, um, I've lived in this town just a few years, um, uh, let's see, since 62. Um, and so I have seen many different ways that people have used their homes as transient occupancy. I think it's very important that you not use the term Airbnb. Right. That is a brand name. Um, so anyway, the situation that I found is that as a business owner, I look at rentals as a business. And what I'm hearing you doing is saying that you're going to take my business and you are going to make the decisions as to how I run the business, who I'm allowed to sell to, how long I can operate my business. I don't think that's right. And you need to include us before you start talking about making all of these decisions, rules and everything. You've got to make sure you have included us. You've got to get us into all of these different commissions if you're going to assign these commissions to look over these things. I think that that's very important. Um, a lot of people here in town, it is really just their home and maybe they'll have somebody come just a couple days on the weekend or something. It isn't a permanent thing that they're doing. These people need that money. We are about to be hit with some really major property taxes as a result of the fire department and things like that. And I think it's important that you know that some of us have no choice. This is a big part of my income to have my garage rented out. And it does very well, but it also should tell you that it isn't it isn't a bad thing to have all these people want to come to town and visit us, and there just isn't enough places to stay. There never have been. I used to own the motel here in town, and it was clear by the occupancy that I had that there was no way to accommodate all of the people that just want to pop into town and, and stay, and there were a lot of people that had that opportunity. My parents used to always, even from the 70s, rent out a room in our house for 35 bucks, anyone who's doing the Shakespeare Festival or something like that. So it's not a new thing. It's been going on for a long time. And unless you can show me that there is some true harm being done by this activity, I just don't buy it. And I'm sorry that some people have properties that could be used as a long-term rental for people, but I don't have to do that. That's not what I want. I don't want to deal with evictions and people that don't pay their rent, don't pay their utilities, which now you make me pay because of council. And n none of that is fair. It's my place. I'll decide what to do with it. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, I just want to, let me just emphasize that we are just starting this discussion. So this, this is the engagement process and I like that 
Kevin and Marianne are thinking about that. But I do want to emphasize we want to strike that balance with, you know, people being able to support themselves versus somebody just sweeping through town and buying up a bunch of places that now can't be used as homes or rentals. So that's why Kevin referred to the larger context here. But this is just starting to be discussed. And I think it is a valid concern, whether you're big or small. Um, so, uh, Connor, Can go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay? Yeah, please. Um, I just, that's a, I'm not here necessarily for this, but, um, but that is an interesting topic. It has been interesting to me. Um, I just, the only thing I want to point out or just bring to consideration to the council when it comes to Airbnbs or when it comes to just renting availability in Yellow Springs is obviously an issue. Uh, the affordability of this village is dwindling very hard. Uh, and I was born and raised here. I have been back here for the first time in six years and I've survived about seven months. I'm a business owner here and I'm about to move because this place is ridiculously unaffordable. And part of that is a combination of uh, the demand of the village itself. It has become more popular. People want to be here, that's a great thing. And obviously, as we're gonna discuss later, my business is kind of designed towards that. But at the same time, I think when it comes to Airbnbs and how you regulate that, I do think that the, the conversation should be less focused on how to charge Airbnb people for that as it is to how to create a better environment for people to actually be able to, uh, for Yellow Springs to be an accessible place in the first place. And the, the greater issue I see with Airbnb is not necessarily what you're describing. And I understand that there's a big difference uh, between somebody that rents out their like guest house and stuff. And I think it's a case by case basis. But there is certainly a national trend for Airbnbs getting like, you know, basically just pillaging rentable uh, properties that, that um, you know, just completely excludes in a village like ours the ability to even have somewhere to rent. And it, and it has gotten worse, as I've noticed. Um, and I think I, I would like to, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are aware, I'm not accusing anybody, but I, I just, I think it should be considered if you're starting to look at how to handle that. Try to think about how it can, whatever your resolution is, how it can help people actually live here. Like, I mean, even locals can't hardly live here anymore. It's a, it's a problem. Yep. And uh, I think that needs to be considered going forward. All right. Thanks, Connor. Yeah, and this is definitely being driven by our affordability goal. Yeah. Mitzi, did you? Well, <coughs> Mitzi Miller, um, I would just like to suggest um, that on these committees to make sure that you have uh, public members that have an interest in some of these different issues. And um, with the housing, I, I'd mentioned that um, there are people in town, for instance, um, that have backgrounds with seniors who are members of our community who would probably be excellent um, committee members. Um, <coughs> his comments were great with this and I think well taken that we need to make sure that if we are looking at some of these things as a committee that you make sure that you have those members in the community involved in it as well. Thank you, Mitzi. Uh, any other comments? Um, I want to comment because I, I am someone who believes strongly in using Airbnbs. I love it. It's so convenient. I can cook my kids their meals that they want to have, and travel is so much easier and affordable. That being said, um, when you have a home that sits empty all week and you don't have the same sense of community that this village is known for, it takes away. So aside from affordability, we also have to think of um, the community in which we're building and or, or dismantling as we have people come in, maybe who live here for a month or two, and then rent their house out to random people who come in and out who have no connection to the community other than 
maybe coming and buying something at my store. It's really hard to, to balance it out, but I think it's the community component is an, is an important part as well, not just the affordability. Right, if you don't live in the town, you can't be part of the community. So it's really hard to, to not take that part into consideration. I, I, I love the idea, but I'm sad of the effect. Right. And your name, please. Molly, Molly Lundy, sorry. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we've got a um, action step, uh, and we'll be continuing to discuss this. And uh, as we always do, we'll be putting out notice. Um, one of the things we had decided we will start doing is on our Facebook page, highlight key topics, since a lot of times we have a lot of things on our agenda, but the ones that we think people want to make sure uh, that they have a chance to weigh in on. Okay. Um, so next up, we are giving a, a brief update on the village manager search. And um, I'll just say quickly that uh, one of the things that we talked about at our retreat is um, probably pushing the timeline forward a little bit. We had talked about having our finalists in town at the end of March, but we'll probably move that to the beginning of April, partly because we learned about uh, spring break happening at the end of March. Um, otherwise, uh, <coughs> we're taking applications until February 15th. Please spread the word. We need somebody who has got a lot of skills. Uh, there's a lot going on in the village. Um, we also are now using LinkedIn to reach out to people, and uh, Judy said that we're getting some hits on that. We're getting, yeah, we're getting a few. It looks like people see it on LinkedIn, and then they don't go through that means to, to make an application, but then they, they send okay. their full information, yes. Good. Um, and uh, I think those are my <laughs> main updates. Uh, anything that we want to talk about uh, before we get into... Uh, well, I guess that's new business, but anything that anyone wanted to talk about with the search? Um, yeah, I, I know we didn't go over the names at this meeting, which is fine. I looked at names that Judy had sent. I was just concerned that there might be two people from the same family. Yeah. And we had, I thought, agreed that we wouldn't do that. It's not a commission. It's a committee. No. Okay. I, 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 but I think we should stick with that. Okay. Cool. I mean, I, I guess I I'd like to hear what other yeah. council people say. We, we've had concerns about two people from the same family being on one committee or commission or board or whatever that that they can talk. That there's just sort of more, un, sort of more undo. It's more than like having two people. It's more like having the force of three people, sort of. Yeah. So. Um, I'd also like to add that um, uh, uh, John Gudgel and Dr. Kevin Magruder sent me a recommended list of people to consider that might be added if we have the, you know, I think we have, we, at our, at our um, retreat, we talked about how there was so much work to do <laughs> that uh -huh. there's ways to involve everyone. And so I have forwarded that to you, Brian. Okay. Sounds good. I mean, I think right now, uh, we're up to over 15. Yeah. These are um, the unsolicited. They yeah. just wrote to me. Well, great. Yeah. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, I want to reiterate that we want all citizens input, right, whether they're on the committee or not. And there'll be lots of opportunities for that. So thanks a lot. Um, and then the last uh, old oh, honey, business yeah. item, which uh, we just need to talk about briefly, at our retreat, we did talk about uh, boards and commission budgets, um, and uh, it seemed that we were pretty comfortable with uh, just sort of bringing forward the particular commissions that are interested in uh, providing programs, Human Relations Commission, the Arts and Culture Commission, Environmental Commission, and uh, potentially the Economic Sustainability Commission. Uh, that they would bring those forward uh, as soon as possible so we can start uh, uh, making those allocation decisions. So um, I think just make sure that we're following the process where you know we've got a pretty well laid out budget and making the case for that. Um, but I'm not sure that we have anything else to really discuss there. So 
Any questions before we move into new business? Okay. Um, if it is okay, let's go ahead and um, uh, move Connor's letter up since he's been waiting uh, for a while. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, let's see. I think actually, Connor, we've read the letter. Uh, why don't you just uh, uh, talk to us about what you're asking for, and then we'll have yeah. a discussion. Absolutely. And thank you to everyone who has read it and considered it thus far. Um, the main points I wanted to make just by bringing it to the council in the first place is that Number one, I want to draw attention to the fact that I haven't really made many requests of the council or the village in the first place the entire time I've existed. This is the fourth year that I've been doing it. It's succeeded every year, and it's been growing and bringing tourism to this town. Um, last year, we were just touching on a couple thousand that we brought in a day to Yellow Springs, um, which there are many benefits too. I mean, you know, I've, I've been kind of tossing the idea that if you would let me have the notion, I think is pretty reasonable that if you uh, assume that 2,000 of these people spent, you know, five, ten dollars each at a local business here, that's ten to twenty thousand dollars that was brought in in a day to this town thanks to this festival. Um, but the greater point is that I wouldn't really be here asking for favors if it wasn't something that was really putting a pinch on my ability to operate this festival. So I, I have talked, I've done what I could do to talk to every department figure that I've been working with for years, uh, including the chief, including Johnny. I did try to talk to Patty, but I was declined. Um, I've tried to make myself available in every way that I can. Um, and that's part of why I kind of wanted to bring it to the council so that I'm here in front of you now. You can ask me the questions as to why I want to be able to operate one hour past the 10 p.m. Saturday sound ordinance. Um, the reason, uh, if you're curious, is because the biggest one uh, is that we bring bands that no one else in this town has ever brought here. Um, that's not really an ego stroke as it is a matter of business, it's money. Um, we spend a lot of money on the bands that we bring here and not only is it a cost figure, it's a privilege. It's not easy to do that. I went through music business school to be able to do that and I've worked my whole life to be able to do that. And so bringing these bands here is not only a risk to me in a business sense, but it also is financially a very big one. Um, so my existence, if I have, for example, which I've been very lucky to not have run into this problem yet, um, is if it rained one day for 30 minutes. Uh, I'm pinched into such a tight schedule when you consider what a music festival is, it relies on having a day's worth of music. So yeah, we start at noon, which is pretty early, um, and we have music all day, uh, and it has a sharp cutoff at 10 if we're functioning in the status quo. Uh, if it rains at all and it delays me 30 minutes, well, the band that's gonna be affected by that is the headliner, which is you know, if you don't know the language of this business, that is my most valuable band. That is who everyone is paying to see. That's who everyone came for. Um, that band also, if you don't know the contractual <laughs> deals of this business, uh, if I cancel, the moment that they pulled up in that parking lot, I owe them that money. So it doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter why you couldn't have them. It doesn't matter uh, whatever the deal is. It, do it really doesn't matter. So some of the bands that I'm paying right now cost $20,000 or more. So I'm asking the village to see the need for the flexibility. I'm not saying that I'm, like I said, I've functioned for years off of not pushing the limits of these laws. 
Uh, but I am telling you that you are this policy without any flexibility is putting a hard pinch on my ability to continue this festival in this town. And it's something that I've worked my whole life to bring to this village. Uh, and that would be pretty disappointing. I, w I would like to not go in the hole twenty, thirty thousand dollars because the village couldn't allow an hour past 10 p.m. feasibly. Uh, so, and that's not to be, I'm not trying to be whatever, but I'm just saying that is the point. That's, it, it is that important to me. And I understand certain parties have expressed that other events have requested such a thing. And I understand as the council, you probably have to deal with all kinds of people's opinions on a lot of things. Um, I'm not ignorant to that. I'm not trying to make little of your, you know, job. I understand it's probably annoying. I got to deal with people all the time. Uh, you know, I run a public event. Yeah, I hear from people all the time. It's really annoying. Um, but uh, the point is, is that uh, those events don't have as much on the line and they're not bringing as much as I do with this event to this town. Um, that's not really an opinion, it's a fact. Like I've, I've worked pretty hard to make sure of what I am providing to this community. It's something I'm very passionate about. And that's no disrespect to the other events. It's just there is a reason why I function the way I do and there is a reason why I request these things. These are not just about special privileges. Connor? Yep. Um, I, I did, I'm gonna interrupt you because I'd like to ask a little, little yeah. get a little more information. And to let you know, we had a, um, uh, a work session during which we uh, council talked about that e even your event the village is putting in some in-kind contribution to it and what we talked about was that when we have those kind of events what we'd re like is to get not only a report back but like some short video clips pictures that then we can use for our for promotion tourism. of the village so sure. I'm putting that out as a request, oh, absolutely. but but I'd like what aside from the fact that people come and they might spend ten dollars or whatever, how do you see that? The, what do you see this offering the village? That is a great question, and I'm glad that you even care about the answer because some well, people, yeah, I, I mean, think, clearly just you do, completely so overlook uh, what I'm really trying to do. Um, so the biggest reasons why I started this festival um, was because I'm. A, I'm a local, I was born and raised here, but on top of that I was a musician, everyone says that, I understand. But I was, I'm a musician from here that has been on the grind of being a musician forever. Uh, nonetheless, born here, which there's not really a lot going for you if you're a musician here, what you, you know, you can play at Peaches once a month. And that's, I'm sorry, but in this business that's not cutting it. Yeah. And, um, and so I went to school, did this, music management degree and stuff, went and did internships, worked for everyone I possibly could, volunteered everywhere I could so that I could make connections and learn everything I could so that I could bring this event here. And then I brought the event here and what that has done is bring bands, the biggest bands that I've ever played in this town historically uh, so that it ties in the local musicians that we have right now with some of the most prominent musical figures in this country. And, uh, and the benefits of that have already shown, like it, they showed even before last year's big success, it showed even in the first year, the second year, um, you know, you had a band like, uh, like Speaking Sons. Uh, they're locals, they've been here, based here for nine plus years. Most of them grew up here. I actually know all of them grew up here. And they have been uh, grinding, <coughs> touring musicians that are Yellow Springs bred. Uh, their whole lives and the first big opportunities that they ever started seeing came at the direct result of the networking they received from me putting in touch with these bands that would have otherwise never ever shown their face in Yellow Springs to play a show for no reason you know what I mean I mean these are bands that play in sold out 2,000 plus shows in New York City they don't come to Yellow Springs Ohio I mean you know it's not it's not chance that they're here, it's, it's a privilege that they're here. Um, and that's something that I think is very important to understand because I understand not everyone's in my business, but I, I fully see how fortunate it is that some of these bands are even being here in the first place. So that's one benefit to our local musicians. Uh, they, they will never have that opportunity again. 
like with, with that's just and that's priceless. Like I'm a musician, I've literally been emailing these agents, building connections with these agencies and I'm paying thousands of dollars. It's getting us favors, it's getting us audience with people that would otherwise never listen or pay attention to us. It, it, that's one direct result. Secondly, um, outside of the music, we created the Springs Fest art market and that's something that we wanted to do um, I don't really want to get into the whole politics of the whole thing, but the, 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 the point of why we created the Springs West Art Market was to give more of a, a microphone and a, a uh, outlet for marginalized people to have something that showcased what they were doing in a community that, all right, see, I don't want to get into the, polit like, just basically I just, we were trying to create something for a group that we didn't feel was represented <coughs> adequately in this town. We should the demographic. The demographic demographic. Yeah. Yes, but I just, you know, I just. No, no, no. It's super important. Super it is very important. It's just, you know, the, some no, things are a conversation it. for they another day. You don't need to go um, round round. Just bullet it out. So, the, the, so basically, I, I, I am not alone in the opinion as a younger Yellow Springs native that this town is viciously underrepresenting minorities. And, um, and that ties into the concept that we already talked about, affordability of this community, mm -hmm. decreasing of, of, uh, of a lot of things. It's a greater issue. It's, I'm not putting blame straight on the council or anything like that. It's a bigger problem than that. But, but at the same time, we, if the question is what we're trying to do to contribute, we're trying to uh, tie our, like, you know, our community into the matter. And so uh, with the visual art market, that's something that a, a dear friend of mine that I grew up with, Sarah um, Morrison does. And I just, I passed it on to her because she, I was like, you know, I think you have a vision and a way to support these people that I'm not as capable of um, satisfying, but you are, and she's done a great job, and it's only growing. And basically, my opinion, to answer the question briefly, is that, yes, do is, that. Is that, is that <laughs> we are doing many things. These are a couple of examples, and I think most of them, outside of just what I'm doing for the businesses in town, like you said, and outside of what I'm doing for the partners that work with me locally, uh, I think we're also reaching even further to do things for just direct community members. And, and I think it's pretty undeniable if you really take the time to look at the facts. But I don't know, you know, we don't have enough time to talk about everything. Okay. Um, other questions from council members? So, so what's been done? Has this kind of request been so, so there have been requests to run past the time before. Mm -hmm. And because when um, events run past the time, we consistently get complaints from the residents, um, specifically from those residents um, in, an, in the immediate vicinity, but also we have had complaints during events um, from as far down as Omar Court, and I, I actually checked to make sure um, Omar Circle. Um, so um, it, it is a consistent thing that when the events go past 10 o'clock, we get complaints from the neighbors about the music. Um, and if the music isn't stopped at 10, they um, tend to continue to call until it is. <laughs> um, so we have, um, and, and then for sometimes for days after. Um, so we have just, you know, because we have the, the ordinance, we have um, just said, no, you can't go past 10. But I would like to challenge, I'm sorry, I mean, I, I would hope this is a discussion. What are these events that, it, historically, the only one I can think of, I am from here, I lived here my whole life up until like, what, five years ago or something, five, six years ago. The only event I can ever think of that ever pushed this boundary was Blues Fest, and they did. They functioned until midnight without an issue forever. I, I think I might literally be the first event since then that's even asked. Well, well I, council I, does have the prerogative, as I understand it, to say it can go to 11. 
Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, and there has been, I do that remember an place. event uh, that was here that did go later, be, uh, Faith Patterson event. And, and, and that was probably before my time. I'm speaking to, oh, since maybe. my time, what has been consistently done. Mm -hmm. And, and well, if we do I'm, take that yeah. prerogative, then it is our responsibility to listen to citizen complaints. Mm -hmm. and, and way, I was here last year and we had a, like two people who were upset, but I think it's, I mean, I, if we want this to be a cool, vibrant community that attracts young people and hip activities, mm -hmm. and then we're like, but everybody has to be quiet by 10 o'clock. I mean, it's like a couple, couple yeah. nights a year or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that council should entertain this so, idea. So I'm Secondarily, gonna, let me just say one more thing, because it really is a fact, it's really a point. Um, because you came to us after Springs Fest to Art and Culture Commission after Springs Fest in response to the complaints about sound. And I really appreciated that you came because you were concerned about the citizens that were concerned. And I think it's worth making that point now that it isn't that you're just like blowing that off. And the other thing at that time, you shared some very specific information with us about some differences in your sound system that would target the sound more intentionally into the field of the audience rather than the sound systems that you had last year that blew the sound out into the community and that that could help mitigate the sounds this year. And yes. I think those are two points that I'd like to add to what you've already said. Well, and additionally, just, I mean, yes, there, there are people that complain. Now, I do want to bring up a fact uh, regardless of what My conversations with the chief and Johnny were that there, of course, were complaints. There are never not complaints. I think that any of you sitting you in a public office You probably office sat here and heard a whole lot of things. It is legitimately <laughs> impossible to do anything, no matter how much positivity it might mm -hmm. carry with it. It is not possible to do something without having some degree of people that aren't happy with it. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not happy about that. I do strive to make pretty much every, I, I would ideally like to have everyone be happy with what I'm doing. You know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to call time and just say, I'm going to propose that we, that council approve this to go till 11 o'clock. <coughs> I don't know if we want to vote on it or, but, well, uh, you're, and you're, that we, it gets advertised very highly that it is going to go to 11 o'clock. I don't know if I need to make a motion. You, you need to vote on it because you're okay, voting Okay, I'm making on a motion that for this event, we allow it to go to 11 o'clock. This will be like a sort of a trial thing, see how it goes, and that it gets advertised so that people understand in the community. And, and, and I would like, like I said earlier, that to get some information back of what hap photographs, stuff that, so that the village can use that is an and our there, promotion. I do want to say that I there second are some that motion. Okay. Thank you. I can deliver things to you even for last year. Okay. Anyway. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. I also want to same note. sign. Okay. No opposition. But I do want to note. I'm I'm really proud to have heard Lisa use hip and cool in <laughs> the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Connor. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say that, you know, uh, again, and, and you can have a seat. Um, Thank you, Connor. What Marianne said is important to me that this is a trial. Let's see what happens. Um, we need to advertise that that's happening and be really clear about that. And, um, yeah. and you know, I want to say the reason why I am, aside from just moving along, is. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I did not go last year, and I probably won't go this year. And, but I do think that supporting young entrepreneur, born and bred entrepreneur, and local musicians, <laughs> having young people, uh, a diverse population come is important. Yes. And have, having something for our local youth as well. Yes. Yeah. And it, if the Art and Culture Commission can help with the ideas about the art market, please get in touch with us. Thank you. Okay, um, let's uh, move into the, uh, well, actually, let's make some decisions. 
Um, so we have candidate vetting process and council goals on our list as well as the Vernet letter um, are on our agenda. Are we trying to cover all these items tonight? I, I suggest we not do goals. Okay. The other people's. Um, for the that? vetting process, I'm okay if we push that because we'll have our first meeting with the, um, ad, the community advisory to, and we could talk more in depth about it. Okay. Um, was anyone here planning to speak on one of those topics? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I think the other thing that this does is uh, we had some revisions after uh, or some proposed revisions after our uh, retreat to the goals so we can make sure that that updated document is out there for the next meeting. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure the feedback from the citizen committee on the vetting process will be useful. Um, so shall we talk about the Vernet letter? Yeah, did people have a chance to read the yes. Vernet letter? Does anyone have any comments, changes that they would want to um, see? You know, the only thing, and it's, it's the thing I bring up every time, is in the last sentence, um, uh, where it talks about, I forgot to bring my computer so I don't have it in front of me, but it talks about how we want to, yes. So this is the sentence that says, uh, potential to serve an important function in our community, repurposing the property to significant benefit. I, I just always like to emphasize in, within that, um, uh, that's, that's also safe for our residents. That's a key word. Right, because again, as we know with the brownfield, mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, it's questionable what we can do. So I just wanna make sure that, yes, we want that to be a property uh, because it's at our gateway that's, that's productively used, but um, just that safety piece. Safe okay. for our Okay, are you comfortable with me figuring out a way to include that? Yep. And it's kind of referenced early on, but I thought just in that context as well would be good. Uh, are they trying to get that in this week's paper? No. Okay. <laughs> Megan's, no. no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's sitting back there, no. <laughs> um, More than just safety in my state, the long-term health and well-being. Yep. Pardon? Long-term. Long Okay. For the for the for the long term yeah. health and well being. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll. I mean, I think you've got general uh, consensus that uh, we should move forward with it. Otherwise. Yes. Great. Um, updating the investment policy can also be done uh, at a future meeting. So uh, I think then that moves us into the manager's report. Um, so the only thing that I want to really bring um, attention to in the um, manager's report, are, there are two things. The first one is the, the PEP um, public entities pool inspection that we had um, and the fact that they are adamant that we um, dismantle the wooden ramps at the skate park. Um, we've been unable to keep them up. There, there have been a couple of uh, volunteers who have said that they would um, work on that and, and have ended up, that has fallen through. Um, and so it's just there to the point now where um, the insurance company is saying they, they shall come out. And so we will continue to look for grants uh, to potentially replace those with uh, similar concrete ramps to what we had out there, um, have them designed. We can maybe look at a, a Tony Hawk grant again um, and do some, maybe get a group of citizens to help with some fundraising because that's how that happened the last time was the citizen involvement in that. Um, so I just want everyone to be aware that is why that is happening. Um, the second thing is the uh, utility roundup that Lisa had asked me to bring an update on. Um, so we have received to date $6,424.73 um, the, in 2018. To date, an additional $1,018.07 has been received since the first of the year. 
So we have a total of $7,442.80 in there. Um, our best estimate is that around 70 people have so far signed up. Oh. Um, and the donations range anywhere from $1 to $20 um, uh, on a regular basis. So um, that's where the roundup stands. Um, this is the first month that we are accepting applications. They're, the one thing Colleen doesn't tell me in here is if we have had any applications for this month, although I have to assume that we would have had. Um, and they have, I think, yeah, I think today would have been the day that, that they would, would be due. Um, Thanks for that update. I'm, I'm disheartened that so few people are choosing to round up. I'd like to understand more about that, and I think maybe we need to get the word out more, maybe in the paper, about the roundup, and that it's easy and it's, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm concerned that's really low participation. Yeah, because we are, we have put out, you know, the, the press releases on Facebook. Megan has put them out for us as well. Um, so, um, you know, maybe we can mm. maybe sweet talk Megan into some kind of article uh. or a short blurb on that, um, something that would help get that word out a little bit more. I, I remember when I was originally researching this that what I read was that places that do it, that you can opt out rather than opt in, have a much higher mm -hmm. rate because a lot of people are not even going to be thinking about it. You yeah. know, an extra ninety, know. Cent yeah. To 90 as you cents. say, opt up. You know, send out something. You will, your thing will be opted up to the nearest dollar unless you choose to send this back and opt out. I'm not necessarily suggesting we do it, given. Mm -hmm the complaints about our utility costs. Right, that's why we didn't. <laughs> we didn't do it yeah. that very intentionally didn't yeah. do that. And, and I do want to point out, there is one more thing in the regular report I do want to put out, uh, point out is that um, the chief, um, I want you to take uh, a look at the um, committee that the chief has um, comprised to do the interviews for the officers because one of the concerns that has been oh, repeatedly yeah, suggested or uh, expressed is that um, we don't have the proper community involvement. And so this new interview panel will consist not only of the chief, the two sergeants, and our uh, Ruth Ann, our human resource officer, but also of community members John Gudgel and Jana Mueller from the 365 group. So we are looking at the things that the community is concerned about. We are working on those things. Um, we're not just ignoring the suggestion. So that is the interview panel that will work on this next round of officer interviews. That's great. And then um, for my end of year report, it is there. Um, I, I included a lot of stuff. Um, if you have any questions about it, please pose them. Um, but um, Denise and Johnny will have their end of year reports for, uh, for uh, planning and zoning and public works in the next packet. Okay. Lisa looks pensive. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions plus, for plus. Patty? <laughs> um, all right, uh, Judy? Only that if you've got any questions about the attached timeline for the, the PD rezoning, um, let me know. That's coming up on your next uh, agenda to start that process. You just went through it. Mm -hmm. uh, this same same outlay, basically, so just if you have questions, ask. That's it. Okay. Um, any things that folks want to highlight with uh, board and commission reports? Okay. I, I have a few, but I, I really, we want to talk briefly about the oh. Justice System Commission. That's on that list. Okay. Um, so for the Justice System Commission, uh, we have our launch plan in the uh, packet. Um, essentially what that launch plan is showing is <clears throat> from starting now, what Lisa and I will be doing in order to build up to the convening of the first meeting, which we are um, being very um, hopeful in our March date to start that up. Um, building up to that, we want to interview past um, JSTF materials, um, past members. Um, we also want to make a matrix of the skills that we're looking for for these um, members of the new Justice System Commission. Um, we'll meet with 
interested community organizations, um, other village leaders, and then at that point, we'll build that up to interview and select commission members. Um, it seems like a long process, but we really want to make sure we know what we want for this commission and that we have the skills that we need in order for it to be effective. Um, and then below that table, we have our timeline focus um, for what we're looking to do with that commission. And I won't spend too much time just because I know this meeting has been a little long, but um, like I said, that is in the packet, um, taking a look at some of the focuses for the commission um, for this year. Yeah, so the Justice System Commission, um, it is kind of taking a next step from after the Justice System Task Force. Um, it became, it came into effect this year. Um, essentially what we're trying to do is uh, focus on that, establish a model um, village justice system that supports a just, safe, and welcoming community across race, age, economic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, ability, and religion. And um, it's pretty much to build the capacity for the village in order to um, seek justice where justice needs to be served and, and build the capacity for the council um, to be able to kind of generate um, that system. Sure. Well, yeah, I appreciate the well thought out plan. Um, which I think also reflects a lot of the work that, uh, that Judith took the lead on to um, remind us how important this work is, um, as we were tonight. So uh, let's talk about future agenda items, uh, and then we will wrap things up. Um, well, obviously we've got several things that we're moving forward from today's meeting. Uh, is there anything else that anyone wants to flag? And then we have some things from our um, retreat that we were going to slot in. Um, I, I, you know, I want to talk about culture of health. I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. But given the overall agenda, I'm, we're going to still be talking about goals. Should we push that to the February 19th meeting? Um, if that's okay with Dr. Um, Sherlock and Cindy. Cindy. I'll, I'll reach out to them. Okay. Because we haven't even spoke about that in terms of the goal, so, although, I don't know, it's up to you. Because um, I want to have time for that. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, well, I feel like, I mean, if they can move to the 19th, that's probably better. Okay, I'll take that. Marianne, you talked about um, the housing uh, advisory group coming back with a proposal regarding transient lodging. Um, I, I will, uh, we have a meeting on Friday and I'll bring it up and we'll see, think about it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, I, I'm thinking that probably we want to have, and maybe it makes sense to have the housing group have a special meeting for people who currently have Airbnb, people who are thinking of it, people who use it, you know, on that topic and mm -hmm. have a special meeting for mm -hmm. that before okay. uh, moving too far down the road on what okay. we would do. But, but write up sort of a position paper that says, on the one hand, these are the benefits, on the other hand, these are the concerns. Mm -hmm. We want to reach out to the community. And are you thinking more of a work session where we'd all be involved or more no. of a community well, conversation? I, 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 it just occurred to me that rather than having it happen at council, maybe the housing board could have a special meeting. Okay. Focus on that. Sounds so good. maybe a report back on February 19th, March 4th, could just push it out a little bit, but put it on a, as a placeholder? Uh, sure. I'm not, well, about the housing thing? Right, just a report no, back. I, you can, yeah, a report back. Yeah, the yeah, next housing so board meeting. A report, I can say where, what we I just want, if you want me to put it on as a placeholder, I can do a report back on TGL from the HAB, for March 4th. For the, I mean, I can just put And it I think it would, be, it would be announcing what our plan is for community engagement, I think. Yes. So, um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I should be able to do that for the fourth. Okay. Just to report back. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, anything else? Thank you. If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. I second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.